The uh, July 18, 2019 Board of Trustees uh, meeting. I note that uh, everyone is here tonight except for Veronica and, is, and Peter is caught in traffic. And I understand that Trustee Beshi is not feeling well and will not be here this evening. Um, so with that, I think we can, we can uh, begin. If uh, I'll ask everyone who would like to, to uh, stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we're going to go to, uh, first of all, for uh, recognition of longevity of service. Uh, each month the college recognizes the longevity and dedication of uh, our employees, and the board recognizes the impact that these employees have had on students, the institution, and the culture that is the hallmark of Santa Barbara City College. Tonight there are uh, three uh, employees we're going to recognize. Two of them uh, could not uh, be with us, but I want to uh, uh, identify for everyone the, the three employees, uh, uh, beginning with David Wong, who has been serving for, get this, 35 years at SBCC. Uh, David is a director of inst instructional technology. Um, we also recognize uh, tonight Devin Lanay, who's been at uh, Santa Barbara City College for 20 years as a network uh, specialist. And thirdly, we recognize this evening Grace uh, Twit, uh, 10 years with Tweet, tweet with, the, with Santa Barbara City College as an administrative assistant, and her supervisor, I assume, is here tonight, Carola Smith. Apologize for the mispronunciation. <laughs> I can't even say that word. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, speak on behalf of Grace Tweed and to recognize her for her 10 years of service. Um, throughout her tenure here at Santa Barbara City College, Grace has worked in a number of roles. And while we are recognizing her for 10 years of service, she has actually worked here for a total of 22 years, which mm. I will explain a little later. <laughs> <laughs> um, while a student at Santa Barbara City College, Grace worked at EOPS and the Transfer Center until she was hired by the Purchasing Department as a full-time employee in 1989 mm -hmm. as senior purchasing clerk. And she worked in that position for about nine years uh, be, until she was hired by the Transfer Center as the senior secretary. And then in 1999, Grace decided to follow her then fiance, now husband Paul, up to Chico. And she ended up working at uh, Chico State University for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Fortunate for the college, um, Grace and her husband became homesick and decided to return back to Santa Barbara in 2009. So from 2009 until 2016, Grace has served uh, to, as administrative assistant to four different deans in student services and in the Office of Student Life. From 2016 till 2019, Grace served as administrative assistant to Dr. Melissa Moreno and supported her in her different roles. Um, Much to the delight of the business faculty and to myself, um, Grace decided this January to return back to the main campus and to retreat to her old position as administrative assistant to the business division. And I would like to read a few quotes from some of our business faculty, which I think accurately summarize Grace's um, personal traits, as well as her professionalism, her commitment to the institution, and foremost, her um, passion and enthusiasm for serving our students. 
So to quote Esther Frankel, it's a pleasure working with Grace because she's incredible, uh, incredibly energetic, <laughs> creative, and supportive. According to Dr. Cornelia Alzheimer, Grace sees where a helping hand is needed, steps up and just does it without having to be asked, has a ton of energy, always a smile on her face, and a supportive word for everyone. Grace is a wonderful addition to our Jack and Julie Nadell School of Business and Entrepreneurship. And finally, in the words of Julie Brown, working with Grace over the past years in her various positions on campus, I have always found her to be calm, organized, informed, and empathetic beyond measure. Her disposition reflects her first name in professional and personal engagements. Grace, it's been wonderful working with you for the past six months. Um, I thank you for your service to the college, and I hope that we will work together for at least another 10 years. Yes. <laughs> So I'd like to say a few words, and um, I'd like to um, deeply express my gratitude for um, what Santa Barbara City College has done for me as a student and as an employee. I'm very grateful for the role that the college has played in my life. Um, SBCC is um, family to me and, um, and has supported me throughout my service here. Like Carola said, I started here and I was in my early 20s and I received my first job as a um, student employee working for the transfer center, Keith McClellan, at the time. And eventually, through the support of the EOPS staff, um, I was successful in landing a position in the purchasing department. Um, they purchased my interview clothes to, to get that job. They were just so supportive. And then, so I pretty much grew up here, and um, I built many relationships with the students and the faculty and the staff. And I had many opportunities to work in different places on campus, and this allowed me to learn more about what the college provides for our students. And like Carola had mentioned, that I left the college for a while, and I worked at Chico State University. So I got to work with first-time freshmen, and I got to see what happens with the city college students when they head over to university, and so that was um, good for me as well. And then, like uh, Carola said, we got homesick, and we wanted to come back home to Santa Barbara City College, and lucky for me, um, there was an opportunity um, to work for Keith McClellan again, and then, um, other deans um, like Ben Partee, Allison Canning, and Melissa Moreno, and now Carola Smith. So although I've worked for many deans on this campus, um, the primary reason I really enjoy working for Santa Barbara City College is um, my interaction and my ability to help students that were just like me when I was younger. And that's what gives me joy, is um, assisting students, watching them grow, excel, and here at SBCC, and then move on. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, allowing me the opportunity to work with these students and for me to just be in my joy. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. I just want to say again, uh, Grace, I, I really enjoyed your, your comments going all the way back to just a few years ago when you were a student here. And uh, you, you said earlier you were l lucky to uh, uh, obtain a particular position. I, I just like to say we're lucky to have had your service all these years. Thanks again. Um, we have no uh, speaker slips tonight for public comment. So what we're going to do because we have uh, a presenter here. Oh, you want to do the report? Okay. Well, we're going to move up the uh, item 9.3 a little bit later on sustainability. But first, we're going to uh, to do our uh, reports. 
uh, beginning with uh, Patricia Stark from Academic Senate. Is this in presentation mode? Let me play with this for just a second. Um, hello. <laughs> and once again, thank you so much for giving me this time to report to you on our summer activities on behalf of the faculty and the Academic Senate. Um, you actually, <laughs> we have colleagues here today. I know Dr. Benjamin is going to present this award later. Um, but the John D. Rice Diversity Award, um, the LEARN Committee, was the winner this year. And um, the nomination was made through the Academic Senate's Faculty Recognition Committee. This is part of the Senate's work. Um, we have a committee that looks for outstanding programs that we can nominate for the various state awards. Um, we actually have a very good track record of winning these awards. And this year has also been very fortunate. I'm just going to show you a couple of images, because I know, Dr. Benjamin, you probably have um, more to say about this later, right? Just a little. OK. Um, and I, I mostly just have pictures. <laughs> um, and I'll let the members, this is from the program. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, for emailing these so I could include these, um, including the narrative about what LEARN is all about. And I actually was very interested to know that um, Condoleezza Rice was the, was, was the daughter of John Rice, right? Am I right? The daughter um, of former President Bush's administration. Um, here is a picture that, again, Elizabeth sent showing Dr. Imhoff's and Benjamin, doctors, Benjamin. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I swam a lot at lunch and the sun's kind of got my brain out of here. The doctors, Benjamin and Dr. Elizabeth Imhoff um, with their award. You'll see this in person today. And I decided, because one of the major projects that LEARN did is um, did all of the research and recruitment to bring the Crossroads anti-racism training on campus. I was fortunate enough to be able to um, participate in that in June. And these are some of the images um, from that incredibly valuable um, workshop. We had a workshop in June, another in August, and we're planning another in September. Um, if you look up on the board in the back, what you can see is that we surrounded the room with a um, with with um, white paper. What do you call it? Butcher block paper. Yeah, and we started in the 1600s and came up to the present, and we populated it with all of the different incidences of um, white domination, of colonization, just the entire history of how. Um, white dominance came to really be the, the um, has developed into the systematic racism that we know now. When we populated that and then we continue to work with that model. Um, I could name these people for you. This is Cosima, um, who is a counselor. And I think that's Roxanne, who is in our um, equity, who's a special programs advisor for our equity group, for our equity center. Um, the Academic Senate had one meeting this summer. We're going to meet twice again in August, but we always have a summer meeting. And we did have some updates in our membership. Um, Robbie Hayes Fisher will be our vice president, replacing Lori Vasquez, who had served for about eight years as our vice president. Um, we are reappointing our liaisons, Kathy O'Connor from Physical Education. You can read above what her area is. Lori Vasquez, again. Um, faculty development. Dr. Ruth Morales from the Economics Department will be coming on as our planning and resource, um, excuse me, our College Planning Council liaison. Michelle Gottwall from Nursing, Planning and Resources, and we're still looking for academic policies. The role of these liaisons is, and this is actually very foremost in my mind because my big work this summer is on accreditation. The, the way that information flows at this college, not only so that people can be informed and educated, but so that people can be informed about making decisions, about contributing to the decision making and the shared governance process. The flow of information is a critical part of that, of that um, you know, what is, I think, really core to the way that, that we do business here. And our liaisons are 
attending um, pretty much all of the campus committees, and then they report back to the Senate what's going on in college-wide committees, as well as representing faculty interest and faculty concerns. So that's a really a big part of how faculty um, stays on top of that flow of information. I just wrote all of this in an accreditation report, which is why it's at the top of my mind. Um, this is probably more of a big deal for me than it is for any of you. <laughs> But the Academic Senate is now using the board docs. Um, the college decided to go whole hog with this. We elevated our license. And so now in addition to your own um, agendas and the College Planning Council agendas, the Senate agendas will be posted there as well. We're going to be talking to the Associated Student Government about this. And um, we're also going to be talking to our Senate committees about using this, this system as well. So there we are. And you can find us. And um, you're probably aware that as of a state law starting January 1st, all of our governance agendas must be posted on the homepage, the college's homepage. So this is much easier for us to just keep that, again, that information flow moving. I put this up here because if you really want to understand the way that faculty works outside of the classroom, I think this is a useful document. And what this is, is um, we have these different committees. And at the end of the academic year, each committee writes a report of what they did that year. And it's a lot of reading. Some of these are very long. But it really shows how faculty is involved. And you can see right there, developing policies, um, developing um, teaching and learning and faculty resources for all of our benefit. Um, our curriculum advisory committee, which does all of the work, directs, actually reports it directly to you on curriculum matters. Um, our faculty lecturer. Um, faculty recognition, part of the reason that we have our learning group before us today. Institutional technology, planning and resources, sabbatical leave and tutorial advisory committee. This is where the work is done. And it's all faculty driven and these are our committees and if you read these reports you will get a really detailed view of some of the things that we have done this year. So I encourage you to do that. And it's connected to board docs. All right, here's some other projects we're working on. The, one of the big ones is what I'm calling the AP to CBA work group, because I've had this job long enough to fall in love with abbreviations and acronyms. Um, <laughs> um, administrative procedures to collective bargaining agreement. And you've heard me mention this several times. What we're doing now through a work group is we're creating a process where over the course of a year, we're going to really elevate education about this process and also maximize um, feedback. So we've set up a series of Friday forums. It'll be the first Friday of the month. The Faculty Association, the Academic Senate will be sponsoring them. We're going to be sending out an extensive Google survey to all faculty listing the five items in Article 13 of our collective bargaining agreement, along with the 23 articles in 7216, which, I'm sorry, 7210, which are all of the working, co the compensation and workplace related issues. And we're going to ask all of our faculty to try to help us prioritize which ones we think should be considered for transference. And then we're going to keep the education loop going through these Friday forums. We're going to put together miniature work groups excuse me, to consider the pros and cons of moving each forward. This is a massive undertaking. Um, we're not even aware of really any other college that has done something like this on this scale. We're trying very hard to partner with the FA um, to keep those relationships collegial, keep us all on the same page, um, and to try as much as possible what's going to make a very challenging and I'm sure a contested process go as smoothly as possible. So we'll continue work with that. Um, bylaws, Academic Senate is very complex, just like you, <laughs> just like this board. We operate by a series of bylaws. We take a look at them every summer, and we do updates as necessary. And then I just want to say a, set, um, say a little bit about Crossroads, and I don't in any way want to diminish the value and profundity of these this three days of training by trying to summarize it in just a couple of comments, in just a couple of um, sentences. But what I wrote to my um, fellow faculty members is I left my three days of training um, deeply confident that I will be a better colleague, a better camp faculty leader, and a better classroom instructor because of the time that I spent. Um, Crossroads educates us on the history of our country. It shows us um, 
how in very, very many ways, those of us who are white have come to live in our white privilege and how that can be a disadvantage when we are working with our colleagues and students of color. And um, I, I could go on for quite some time, but I really encourage anyone and everyone to participate in this. I found the facilitators to be wise and non-judgmental and incredibly um, humanitarian, um, humane, I should say. Um, and I think that I want to really thank my colleagues and learn for bringing them on campus. Um, as of the end of August, we will have, I think, Elizabeth, how many? Faculty members trained in this? And part of what Crossroads believes is that if we can create a critical mass of educators who have this type of training, then we really can start to affect institutional change. So um, anyway, I went in August, we have another, I, I went in September, another one in August, and we're planning one for September. Okay, finally, let me wrap up by talking about accreditation. Um, accreditation is where I've been working on intensely the last couple of weeks. We have um, several faculty members who are working. And if you're new to the board and new to accreditation, um, it, it, just sounds, it just sounds deadly dull. And, but it, it, when you get into it, it, it isn't. Because at the core of it, what accreditation is, is let's measure ourselves against a set of standards. And those standards are incredibly comprehensive. They touch on every aspect of what we do. And so we have faculty members working in these four areas. Elizabeth and I are working on leadership and governance. Um, we're looking at how do we provide evidence of that we're meeting these standards and then providing some narrative to that effect. Um, on June 25th, we met with Dr. Stephanie Droker from the ACCJC, the, 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 the national organization, to discuss how to do this. We're going to get this wrapped up fall 2019, but most faculty members are working on it this summer. And these are my takeaways, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm far from done, just kind of putting, stepping my toe in. I'm finding, at least in the areas that I'm at, governance and leadership, that in, in most areas we do exceed expectations. There's lots of evidence that we are meeting these standards, too much. I mean, the hardest job so far has been taking my thousands of words and cutting them down to a few hundred. We have areas that are going to need tightening and tweaking. Um, we're going to have some areas that need deep thought and that are gonna need action. And the process is valuable simply because it forces us to do this, to identify our strengths and our weaknesses that in the rush of the day to day, um, we tend not to do. So that is going to be, um, that is gonna be the work of this group of faculty members joining with Dr. Ralston and others on getting this done. We have a target date in about 18 months when it will be complete. I think you guys have a part of this that you will do as well. So anyway, um, that is my report for July 18th. Thank you so much. Any questions? Guess not. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Our next report uh, is a report by the Associated Students from Alexandra Montez de Oca. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. All right. Hello and good evening. Um, my name is Alexandra Montes de Oca. If um, some of you don't recognize me, I'm here to give a report um, for today. So over the few months, I've come to know some of you sitting here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am the new Associated Student Government President. Um, this is my second year being the Neuro Club President of one of the campus clubs, and I am a third year neuroscience major. Um, a little bit about me, just a brief overview. I'm originally from East LA. Uh, I've been living in Santa Barbara for a little bit over five years now. Uh, I previously attended Westmont College for three years and then transferred to City College where I am now for the past few years. A um, couple goals. Coming into this position, my goals for the year including um, having some extra trainings as uh, was just previously, previously mentioned for anti-racism, but more aimed for student leaders as well. I believe we should get them involved in this uh, as they are connecting with the students on a lot more level, you know, meeting after classes, having club meetings. Um, so advocating for that. Um, 
I, as a student leader, I am a strong advocate for mental health on college campuses. Uh, just a few days ago, I had the honor to attend the Rice Awards in Sacramento with other SBCC faculty, um, where we received the award for LEARN. Um, at the award ceremony, I gave a speech uh, that shared my personal experience coming from uh, Westmont College, where I personally experienced being ostracized for my differences. Coming from that personal experience, I don't want any student to feel the way I did. Um, so I'm a strong advocate for mental health on college campuses. Um, so in regards to our student board, um, at the moment we only have three filled seats out of 15 that are stated in our bylaws. Um, from those remaining 12, um, it has been determined with the help of Daniel Wallace that uh, five of those seats are essential uh, to fill and the rest of the positions can be uh, delegated. Uh, the seats that are currently filled um, are the student trustee held by Kenny, a student advocate held by Sage uh, Gaspar, and then myself as president. Um, starting August 26, uh, applications for the ASG position information will be sent out to the student body. It will also be on the pipeline, email, kind of like the advertisements. Um, applications will be available until September 19th. Uh, reviews of the application will be done on the 20th, and then interviews as well as appointing members will be done on the 27th of September. The new board will begin September 30th. Uh, due to us lacking so many seats uh, for our members, other efforts to ensure that a full board is achieved by that deadline would be reaching out to faculty members and seeing if they have a student they know of that would be a good nomination for the open position. Um, so being in touch with them. Uh, also reaching out to student leaders like club leaders and seeing if they have an interest in getting a higher role as far as ASG. That is how I got into this role. Uh, I was at a meeting and I was for a club meeting and um, Josh reached out to me and he was like, hey, do you wanna be part of ASG? And I, that's how I applied. Um, so that would be another option. And then a last one would be just going to classes and personally saying, hey, you know, we have open positions for ASG. Uh, are you considering applying and just have flyers? Um, and advertising that way. So those are the three ways that we will try to start to get the um, board members you know, in place uh, before the deadline. So that is my report. Well, thank you very much and thank welcome you. to our meetings. I take it we'll be hearing from you on, on a regular basis at future meetings. And uh, thank you for stepping up to, to serve in this leadership role. It, uh, as a student and uh, who's got studies to worry about. It's, uh, it's always impressive to see students who are willing to, to serve, and I hope it's a good experience for you. Does, it, does anybody have questions for Alexander? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Our next report will be uh, on classified staff from uh, Liz Oshenklaus. Good afternoon, Liz. Good afternoon, members of the board. Mr. President, uh, I don't have much to report because Classified Consultation Group hasn't met for the summer. We have a meeting scheduled for the end of next week before the CPC retreat. But I did want to mention that we've been in negotiations. CSC has been in negotiations with the district for over a year now. And luckily, we've been making some good progress. I have to thank our team and the district negotiating team. We started to move forward and hopefully Sometime soon, we'll be able to bring you a contract for ratification. We still have some work to do, but we've been making good progress, and I just wanted to let you know. So thanks. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin, do you have a report for us this evening, this afternoon? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I want to uh, congratulate and, and welcome Alexandria as our new uh, student body president. We're looking forward to your leadership of the students and your participation with us as we help students reach their educational goals. So welcome and congrats. Um, Patricia said, made some comments about the summer. And ever since, I've been in school all my life as a student or an employee and every summer of my life, I've looked forward to, to the summer because things are supposed to slow down. <laughs> well, they never do. And it's certainly not the case here. We've just had a really busy summer. We are having a really busy summer, really reflecting on 
things that have come before, but also planning for the future. And just to give you a, a snippet of what we're doing, we had a management retreat last, uh, well, Tuesday of this week where we developed goals for managers for the coming year. We developed a mission statement for managers. We did a lot of good work on Tuesday. We have had two meetings of what we call PC Plus. That's the President's Cabinet plus the other leaders of both unions and the Senate. And our primary topic has been budget. And you've given us some kind of marching orders on find ways to cut uh, or increase. So we've been really working as a team on that. And, and we're planning another meeting. We have a retreat planned for our College Planning Council, which is our governance group. We're looking at our operating procedures. We're looking at things we're going to do this year. We're looking at strategic directions. And that retreat is planned for July 29th. And I extended the time on it today. I'm sure everybody got a, a message about that. We are also having a President's Cabinet retreat on August the 5th. And we are doing the same thing. We're doing some planning for the upcoming, for the year we're in, actually. So, and we're also, with the leadership of Corolla, planning our opening day, big doings. It promises to be very, very exciting. And I want to uh, really thank Corolla for her leadership of this effort. And we've heard about the Rice Awards. And I have a copy of the program, which I'll just pass around in case you want to look at it. But that was a, a really bright spot in my week anyway, we were in Sacramento on Tuesday to celebrate this group of individuals from our college who are doing obviously praiseworthy work in uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And what we learned there is that there were nine different groups nominated from up and down the state for this award, and only two were selected. And our LEARN program uh, was one of the recipients. The other was uh, a group from Bakersfield College. So it was really a wonderful program. We, they took all sorts of pictures, but they, uh, Elizabeth and Alexandria had the opportunity to speak on behalf of our group. And they did an excellent job of sharing <coughs> what happens here with this program and the impact of the program on our college and especially on the people who participate in the program. I want to share that we are able to have such a program because of the writing of a grant. And Elizabeth can talk just a little bit more because I, did, I don't remember the name of the person who did it. But it's a Title V grant. It's an HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutions. And it's a flexible learner grant. And it's a five-year grant. So we have five years, um, three years left on the grant. And I want to congratulate them on the having this really creative and impactful idea and then getting funding. These are highly competitive grants. And so some of the members of that group are here today. And I'd like for Dr. Imhoff to come up and introduce them, if you don't mind. I have a list, but I think it's better for her to introduce them, because I would love for you to see them. And then I asked her to bring the award because I want you to see how heavy it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's quite lovely. And so um, they have done an excellent job. So. LEARN has been such a great success because it has been completely collaborative. It really has been the, 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 the work of, of a group of really dedicated colleagues. Um, and no one person um, can take credit for this. This is a, a group effort. And I think that's so important. So uh, Chris Johnson is one of our members. And he's going to come up because he's going to get the word too. And Annette Cordero. <laughs> Clara Oropesa, Cla Clara Oropesa, Carrie Hutchinson, and is anybody else here? Okay. So we also have Armando Ramos, Tomas Carrasco, Vandana Gavaskar, um, Joshua Ramirez, Am I forgetting anybody? Ana Garcia. Okay. This is Lord.
And I just want to add that the um, Crossroads is one of the training programs that they offer, and the next one is August 7th, 8th, and 9th. And board members, if you're interested in attending, which you have to attend all three days, just let me know, and we can get we have uh, we can get you in. <laughs> so, so thank you. I had one other announcement, though, if it's okay. Sure. Me, before you get to that, Dr. Benjamin, I understand there's also going to be one in September, Crossroads training. Is that Elizabeth? One in September. I'm sorry. Okay, you're hoping you get those dates, 13 through 15. Okay, and then there was one other announcement I wanted to make, and, I, and board members know about this already, but we received a verbal notification from the state chancellor's office. As you know, there has been, uh, we have been waiting for final confirmation about the funding of uh, facilities, and there was a whole list of, of uh, colleges that we're waiting on this. And so we received a notification that we have been awarded $32 million for the quote unquote necessary reconstruction of our sports pavilion. And uh, that includes the gymnasium, staff and faculty offices, and athletic classrooms. And so we, found, we have an advisor whose name is Middlestead. I can't remember his first name. Yeah. And all of you know him, I think. You've met him before, he's been in our meetings. And he let us know this week that we have to start immediately on architect selection. And our plan is to start the interview process for an architect as soon as possible and hopefully present to you uh, bids at the August 22nd meeting with a recommendation from those who bid on the project of a successful a firm to work with us in developing the architectural plans for this uh, facility. And I just wanted to let you know that we're supposed to be moving on it right now. So, so this is happening. This is happening. <laughs> okay. Any, any questions? Uh, Trustee Booth. Just a quick question on the award. Is there anything that we can Share to our networks just to promote the college anywhere online that we can get. You a statement or yeah, just something we could. We can send you something. Yeah, pictures. Oh yeah. sure. Oh. Cool. Oh okay. Yeah, I'd love that. Okay. Um, anything else, Doctor Benjamin? I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, do we now want to move to item 9.2, uh, presentation on uh, sustainable, might be 9.3 on sustainability? It looks like uh, Lindsay Moss will. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. It's so nice to be able to say good afternoon. Every time I'm up here, it's late in the evening. So good afternoon, uh, board members. I just want to introduce for you our consultant, Prin Pellegrin. She's with Innovative Workshop Consulting. She's been working with the district for a number of years. Uh, phenomenal help to us with all of our sustainability projects. She helped us earn our LEED Platinum certification on our West Campus Center building. And um, she's a LEED accredited professional. She's been working in sustainability for many, many years. She has the honor of being the first sustainability manager in the UC system at UCSB for eight years. And now she's on her own doing uh, consulting and has been a great asset to us. She's helped us update our sustainability plan. We already had one in place. This is an update. And I'm going to pass it along to her to describe the process that we went through and where we're at now with the plan. Thank you. And welcome. Hello. Good afternoon. As, as Lindsay stated, this is an update from 2014. I presented the sustainability plan somewhere between 2014 and 2015 to the trustees at that time. And uh, the plan had short, intermediate, and long-term goals. And it was time to reevaluate the plan. Um, assess goals that were achieved, redefine the baselines and benchmarks for the campus, and that's exactly what we did. Um, 
in 2018, 2019, and we did it through the stakeholder engagement process. Um, the first year we had between 60 and 80 stakeholders. Um, this time around we probably had 50 or 60, but it included staff, students, faculty, um, outside agencies that could support our sustainability goals, nonprofits, and just people of interest. It was open to anybody. We sent um, massive emails, did um, outreach to specific people and departments um, so that we got views from all different areas of campus because that's how we get the best plan and it also supports buy-in. Um, everybody knows the people, the planet, the profit, that sweet spot sustainability, but in order to make the sustainability plan not a paperweight, the stakeholder engagement is key. Also identifying the campus baselines and um, drafting it in a way that everybody understands. I could say 500,000 gallons of water were, was saved, but if I associate it with how many Olympic swimming pools, people kind of get a better idea. Um, and then last but not least is education and outreach. With my experience, that's the most difficult part. Um, I'd love to work with someone in the art department and have some example that has CO2 emissions or bubbles coming out to show that this particular energy efficiency project saved this many in emissions, but it's very hard to tell the story when it's not some photovoltaic panel. Um, lighting retrofit is not as interesting as maybe seeing photovoltaics or a fuel cell. So the education and outreach component um, was another major focus of this particular sustainability plan. Oh, and by the way, we stuck to the same categories, which are up here, seven, um, that were buildings, waste, food, water, purchasing, transportation, and energy. Those seem to be the categories that seem to fit with this campus. Um, so these, I'm not gonna go over all the benchmarks, but transportation, I believe we are at 7%, now we became 13 of single occupied vehicles, and those of you that are engaged or participate in SBCC Commute, that's the program that is making that benchmark improve over time. Um, waste, we did a student waste audit in November where we um, were able to identify a 51% diversion rate, so we're aligning with the state of California goals. <coughs> Water, um, City College has been a Water Hero Award, as you can see, for reclaimed water and irrigation. We're at 98% and um, a 22% reduction in water with a goal of achieving another 8%. Um, energy, um, expanding renewable energy is one of the goals, but there's already energy here, and one of the main things we wanna do is start expanding metering on buildings so we know how um, the buildings are actually performing and we can make adjustments over time and identify some key low-hanging fruit energy efficiency projects. And then food, the food category is very um, near and dear to the student population. And a lot of people ask why this category is in there, but if you know how many gallons of water it takes for one pound of beef, the biggest impact you can have on water savings is by just maybe adjusting your meat intake on a weekly basis. Um, I particularly love meat, but um, I do keep that in mind when I go to the grocery store. Another aspect of this plan is it's a set of goals, and the goal here is it's not a mandate where we have to reach the 30%. If we're at 22% and we reach 28%, it's the triumph over good versus perfect. As long as we're making that move to improvement, we know we're on the right path. It's when we identify the baselines and the benchmarks and we're not doing as well, that's when we need to rearrange the goals and the strategies we have here on campus. So I wanna really hone in on, these are not mandates or absolutes, these are goals to move the campus forward and when there's a good time and place to institutionalize these goals and strategies, that's when we're going to do it. And then another part of the plan was we presented a set of goals and benchmarks and we took at least an hour going through the goals with the stakeholders and had an agreement and we adjusted them so we had buy-in with 60 people. And then from there, we worked in groups identifying the roadmap, um, the communication strategy, any roadblocks, and a timeline. So identifying <coughs> what's a quick win and low-hanging fruit that we could achieve instantly, what's a long-term goal. And at the end of the day, we came up with the following goals. There's only about seven or eight, so they're not um, hundreds and hundreds of pages. It's their goals that are achievable with the idea of achieving them by 2021. And I, I believe they're doable, and um, the campus is already on the right path. And a few ways we're gonna work on, oops, let me go to the goal. We're talking about awards. I want to identify that the campus has been recognized for some of the 
programs that have already been in place. Um, the West Campus Center obviously achieved LEED Platinum with, through the U.S. Green Building Council, um, but the local USGBC chapter here has identified the SBCC Commute Program um, as something that everybody should try to strive for with providing an incentive money for people to get out of their occupi single occupied vehicles. Um, with that, how do we keep telling the story and how do we integrate this into the campus? Um, who will lead? Obviously, business services and their departments take a huge role, but also we're developing task forces where the people, the, the stakeholders that were involved in the planning process can figure out what areas they want to focus on and help assist if it's with waste management and encouraging people not to use another Starbucks cup, um, you know, helping out with the out outreach and um, just looking around the campus on how we can make improvements. And then um, platforms to use. This past year, we were able to present some sustainability and SBCC commute information at new employee orientation. Um, I'd love to be able to have two minutes at Vicara Welcome to tell the students about what programs we have in place and um, the impact of driving a car to campus and some other alternatives just to make life a little bit easier and stress-free commuting to and from campus, especially the first couple weeks of school because we all know what that can be like. And then also off-site activities, working with um, the city of Santa Barbara and Bike Share and other agencies around town that could help support our goals and we can help them. And last but not least, how to tell. Um, each goal or project I work on, I try to provide a detailed case study that can be, the story can be easily told. Um, also working with Luce and the Department of Communications for a consistent message of what we're trying to do if we're making changes to the waste and recycling plan or overall reduction strategies. And then um, everybody's favorite, the social media. And with that, um, that's the end. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank, thank you very much. It, it's, uh, it, it's gratifying to hear the work that uh, we're continuing to do and will continue to do in the area of sustainability at what I would call our local level, given that uh, support and leadership at the national level is so severely lacking at the moment. Yes, Trustee uh, Haslin. The, the variable of transportation. Oh, am I on? Mm -hmm. You are. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious, we're making progress. To what do you attribute that progress? Well, we we've keep expanding the SBCC commute program if that's adding more carpool spaces, um, working with MTD to fit student schedules um, that align with uh, class schedules. Um, we've been expanding EV charging stations. We have the incentive program where uh, staff and faculty get up to $2 a day, up to $40 a month if they don't travel in a single occupied car. Um, students get some refunding if they carpool. So we keep expanding and then we're working on, um, we're keeping up with what's happening at the Air Pollution Control District, the city of Santa Barbara with bike share, uh, the, the city is expanding bike um, paths that are allowing people to commute to campus more safely through the bikes. So it's a, it's a huge um, area that people are trying to improve for, for the environment and uh, cost savings. Do, do you have a sense of which of those options works best? We do have a mode split that we that I could provide you of how people are getting to campus. We do that every year where we count who's coming by bus, bike, car, et cetera. And that um, mode split has been ever increasing and the bikes have actually gone up. Carpool has gone up because we've expanded carpooling. So um, we do have that information. Good, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Trustee Croninger. Um, it's an excellent plan, and I thank you for all the work and all the people who have worked on it. Uh, it's certainly something that I support and have supported since joining this board. A couple of things that I would like to see added would be one, consideration of our carbon footprint, mm -hmm. and two, um, uh, where you can, and I think in many ways if we, are, if we really think about this, a sense of cost and benefit. Um, this is a question I do get from um, people in the community about, well, what is it costing you to do this and how much are you saving? I know, for example, the 
um, solar energy panels. Probably we, we've calculated that already the, um, in connection with getting the, the money from the state for that. Um, other areas where, you know, it's pretty simple and some mm -hmm. where you might need some imagination to really figure it mm -hmm. out, like maybe the food waste, I don't know. But I think having that cost-benefit component and being transparent about how we're calculating it would be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee Abu? Yeah, I, I really agree with what's already been said. Um, I really support this plan. It's, it's very good. The goals are you know, I think we can meet these goals. I think we can maybe even exceed them. Um, one question I had is, in terms of what happens next, what are we doing to look at the bigger picture of, you know, the climate is changing, there is a climate crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, it would be good to know our carbon footprint because if it's at one point, we can know let's, we probably have to cut it in half or, you know, down to zero eventually. Within, and so knowing what it is would be really helpful, but also, mm -hmm. What are the impacts of the climate changing on the campus and how do we mitigate those? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we want to do as much as we want to, you know, completely avoid that kind of situation, but we aren't the only ones who are controlling this. And if this situation gets worse, our campus is on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, you know, square one. Uh, I think I went on a swim too today. Uh, we're ground zero for where something yeah. terrible could happen. And I wouldn't want to affect the investment that the community has had uh, in this institution. So I think this is good, but I think we um, should maybe start thinking about this uh, bigger yeah. step of you know, climate adaptation, but also what is our carbon footprint and how do we get that down to zero one day? Because uh, you know, it, it's going to take us doing that and everyone else doing it to avert a climate crisis. Um, just to speak to those two points, we do have some cost benefit on a per project basis, but it sounds like a good idea would be to do a total carbon footprint, which would be very easy to do due to the fact you have two main meters for gas and electric and you don't use steam, so we could quickly take um, the usage data and, and provide that information. Um, and we could probably do it for the past couple of years to show the energy efficiency projects that have been implemented and the impact it has caused. Um, we can't do it currently on a per building basis because we don't have metering. Um, we have very little metering to do on a per, per, um, per building basis, but we can do it on a campus wide basis and maybe show a trend from like 2014 until now, if that would be something, yes. Yeah, uh, when I say carbon footprint, I'm thinking even broader than that. I think that's a good component of it, but I'm also thinking that a, probably the largest component of our carbon footprint is our commuting. Yeah. Yes, um, and we yeah. actually probably have that information as well, um, because that's one of the projects I started on originally working here was, um, it, it was more from a point of getting cars off the road, not necessarily the impact, but we, we could definitely um, pull that data together because I have a lot of data. <laughs> Just we'll have to rearrange it and provide that. Yeah. And would you want transportation for travel or just commuting? I think all of the components. I mean, the reduction in the number of people taking single cars to campus would mm -hmm. be good. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a bigger picture of how many people come to campus from how far. Mm -hmm. um, and I also agree with Jonathan about the climate change. Um, that's significant. I mean, the maps from the city suggest that um, in 30 years, I think, we will, parts of our campus will be the beach. Um, <laughs> and we will not have the, the uh, current football field, perhaps, because it will be the beach. Yeah. I, I would just follow up with, in terms of our carbon footprint, I mean, everything we purchase, every car that leaves or comes to campus, Basically, anything we do that contributes to the mm -hmm. use of carbon, I think we mm -hmm. should be assessing. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Have a great very night. interesting. I move to approve the 2019 District Sustainability Plan. Pardon? I move to approve the 2019 District Sustainability Plan. Is there a, a second? A second. It's been moved and a second, any discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Passes unanimously. I believe we now move to the approval of the uh, minutes for the June 13 um, meeting. 
Do I hear a um, motion to approve? I move we approve the minutes from July, June 13th, I think. Excuse me? June 13th, yes. thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And uh, now we'll move to item uh, six, development of the uh, consent uh, agenda, which tonight includes items uh, 7 7 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 8.1, and 9. Uh, I believe that's, well, 9.2. We've already addressed 9.3. And uh, 9.4, are there any items that any trustee would like to have removed from the uh, consent agenda? 7.1, please. I'm, I'm pardon? 7.1, please. 7.1. And uh, President Miller, could I just ask for clarification on 9.1, the ratification of purchase orders? Um, should that be on for consent? And it doesn't it, it's not listed, but I think it's meant to be. Yes, it is. Okay, we'll we'll add nine point one then to the to the list. Trustee Croninger. Um, I hate to do this because I know we have a lot of important things to talk about coming up, but um, I do have some questions about seven three eight one and nine one. Say that again. Seven. Hopefully, hopefully we could deal with them quickly. But say say the numbers again. <coughs> Seven, seven three. three, eight, one, and nine, one. Okay, well, let's start with item uh, uh, 7.1 and uh, hear from Trustee Gallardo. Yeah, my, uh, I emailed the questions already to Dr. Benjamin and she answered them and so the response is sufficient other than that I want to pull it so we can vote separately. Um, I will be voting no on it at this time as the uncertainty under the uh, establishment of new positions. And later in board uh, reports, I will um, speak on my suggestion and recommendations. I'll go ahead and move approval then of item 7.1, permanent personnel. That's a motion to? Yeah. Okay. Is there a second? A second. There's a motion and a second. Is um, there a discussion? Yes. I was going to ask some other questions about that. Um, the uh, several questions on permanent personnel, um, looking at the 619 agreement with CSEA, it seems to me that we're expected to ratify that. Are we going to do that at a later meeting? I'm, I'm lost. Um, permanent personnel, which is 7.1. Okay. There is attached to that an MOU with CSEA, which provides that it will be effective when the board ratifies yes, that's the agreement. But I think we're being asked to approve the people, not ratify the agreement. That MOU is also in reference to on the permanent personnel document. You see the security reorganization. Security Correct. That, that's but I'm listed. saying separately, shouldn't we have an agenda item maybe later to uh, ratify the agreement? Because it's, well, it says by its terms that we need to ratify it to take effect. The agreement with CSEA. That hasn't been approved? Not the that I know of. It I looks, it's signed by the district June 4th. But it provides subject to board ratification. I don't think we've done that. I that, thought it was done in February. It's correct that it hasn't been ratified by the board, but in, historically it's been in that permanent personnel document is where it's been listed as the changes. So, so by, by approving 7.1, we would be approving the uh, the agreement. Is yeah, I wish, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of our VP of HR who's not here, but I'm assuming that's why she attached it, so it was back up for that permanent personnel document. Well, I'm just saying it leaves this, the agreement hanging when by its own terms it says 
this tentative MOU is subject to ratification by CSEA and the Santa Barbara City College chapter and the approval of the Santa Barbara Community College District Board of Trustees. So I'm just like I, trying I, to close I that loop. I don't know enough about it to speak okay. on it. Liz, do you have We could look at it later. I'm, it's obviously not here now, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had it in here for backup on the security okay. officers piece. Okay. That was one. Um, the MOUs haven't always been included. Usually if you approve the personnel, you also are approving the MOU. We haven't been listing them separately in the past, but we thought you should see what the MOU I guess we didn't like. know they were out there. <laughs> but anyway, that's how we've been doing it. So if you were to approve the, the personnel with the item in it, you would, we would agree that you were approving the MOU also. But you do it the way you... <laughs> well, we can sort it out later. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, What's important to the staff and security is for them, for their personnel items to take effect. I get that. They've been waiting a long, long time. It's been in the process for two years. So I just wanted to reiterate that. And it's very important to them to get this uh, taken care of after all this time. And I think it's a fair, a fair agreement for them, too. They have a lot I'm of additional not, responsibility. I just want to I'm not disagreeing with it. Yeah. I'm just yeah. confused by yeah. the paper that yeah. I think we need to clarify need to the it. process of how we get MOUs approved. But typically... MOUs have not come to the board right. for? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so not. it hasn't been, a, your past practice is not to approve them separately, although it says that, I, it seems. Yeah. I have no experience with it. We've, yeah. as you know, we've gone through some uh, changes in uh, HR over the years, and things kind of changed how they do. So we're trying to, right. I know HR is trying to get it all worked out of exactly the best, best practices, but. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Okay. Well, I apologize for not bringing it up separately. I just noticed it, like, at the last minute. So. Yeah, that's fine. But it, as I think you pointed out, we need to work on our processes for how we bring things to you. I'm sure HR would agree that we have a little work to do there, and especially since we have contract ratification, hopefully, in the next uh, period of time. Yeah. We'll do some research on this. It seems that you would be approving MOUs. I don't By a vote, approving 7.1. Yeah. yeah, in this case, I mean, according to your past practice, if you approve 7.1, you've approved the MOU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can just do it differently in the future, I suppose. Yeah. Any other comments on item 7.1? Um, only a general thought that, that as we think about new positions, and this one has been in the works for a while, that um, I am concerned about the budget. And, you know, we have a structural operating deficit, so new positions do cost more money, not less. And balancing that with maybe reducing positions somewhere else would be helpful. I, I don't think this would be an increase to the budget. And it's tied to the money we receive from the state and the mm -hmm. equity plan. Any other comments? Uh, not hearing any. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to uh, approve item 7.1? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, next item taken out of the consent calendar is item 7.3, experts and uh, volunteers. I believe this is an item that Trustee Croninger asked to address. Let me get it up here. Um, okay, I think my question here for both experts and volunteers and, and purchase orders, which is 9.1, is that the numbers that are being listed, um, both for the experts and the numbers in our purchase order ratifications are bigger than I'm used to in many instances. And I'm suggesting that we would benefit from a clearer understanding of what winds up on what list here. So like we have a person coordinating and planning outreach services for $10,500 on the list, general fund. Um, I don't know, I mean, is, is that something that has a contract or not have a contract. And so I'm just saying we I maybe think through that. Now, I know. I'm I, it, not again, prepared to answer. This is a surprise. 
Yeah. And I keep asking you. I actually asked that in question. In I actually asked that question, and I have did an I answer. answer it? Pamela, yeah, you guys all did. And oh, it's actually, okay. uh, it's actually great. It's to support dual enrollment, um, and it comes out of um, anyway funding that they've been working on. And <sighs> Pamela can answer it. Pamela, it's a regional work with the deputy director navigator that they that's oh, under that's the Strong Work Hopes program. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's great work. I'm not worried about that. And I, and I apologize, Helen, because I know you asked me for no surprises, and I don't mean to be a surprising anybody, okay. except that I it's looked at it at the last minute, and, okay. Okay. and that these were the parts where I feel like it's relatively routine for us, and so I don't pay as much of attention to them early on. Um, and so I didn't notice that I was seeing larger numbers than I'm used to, so that's kind of the general comment on both of those. So on the experts, these are not to exceed, it looks like maybe $11,000. I don't know what our rule is here. So your question is, and then on purchase orders. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of times with purchase orders, I know they are a subset of a contract I've already seen under contracts. So, you know, we've hired a company to construct X and so, and that work is divided up into various purchase orders. Here, I'm not recognizing the names and it's looking like um, more things are going through purchase orders. And maybe they are, I mean, I don't know. A purchase order is like a one page piece of paper that is not much of a description of what's going on contractually. Yeah, I think part of this too is because we are the um, fiscal management. The, Fiscal agent for strong workforce, mm -hmm. and so a lot of that comes through, and all of us, all of it does not necessarily pertain to our college. I think that's probably some of the large numbers. So exactly, what are you requesting? At some point, that we just have a clearer understanding of what shows up on what piece of the agenda, perhaps. You know, what are the what are the criteria that cause something to come up as a contract versus? The versus an expert with no contract versus a purchase order with no contract, but presumably a purchase order. So maybe we can further define it at the top. Yeah, yeah. Each, as a topic. Each one of the categories. Yeah, what somehow understanding the maximum. that. Okay, that it makes just, sense. It just felt like it was changing, and I apologize again for not raising it sooner okay. that way. Okay, all right, And, Thank and you. this one that you're asking, Marcia, it, it, they said that it is a contract for the consulting company, but it's under experts. Right. Yeah, so it, it, I guess, I mean, it's valid to. Um, and we do, we just hired a new uh, purchasing uh, di director. We were working on this today. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll try to make that clearer. Yeah. And you, I appreciate You need to know that. what you're approving. That's it's not a problem. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So do we need a motion on items? You still want item 7.3 and 9.1 pulled um, from the consent listing? Sure. Motion to approve 7.3 and 9.1. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Hearing none, motion passes. 8.1. Okay. And we also have to address uh, item. When already? 8.1, I think. 8.1. Yeah. I don't recall whether, I believe you brought that up, Marcia, 8.1. Yeah, that is our um, stipends. Um, and I know we did have some discussion about that. This is one where I'm feeling like I don't, uh, again, the numbers are very large in some cases, not all. And I'm not getting a lot of, a very, clear picture of what is being approved in terms of um, <coughs> hours, work, and time, and all of that that would be paid for at this high level, I guess, is what it comes down to. You're asking for more detail about each of the items? Yeah. So well, how, how we everything. get to the total, maybe, for each one? How do we get to one? the total? What is the time that goes into it? Um, we have to, as I understand it, these are always existing employees, um, and we are asking for work outside of the normal expectation for your job, 
and, and how we draw that line. I think those issues have come into focus recently um, with the, the federal government, and, and I just felt like I was a little short on understanding that as well. Yeah, I would, I would agree. The, it's, it's, and there, there are cases now pending where <clears throat> college districts are being sued because there was no oversight or there was no apparent oversight, which is really what we're talking about, uh, and a, a two or three word statement doesn't really allow us to know what it is that we're approving. Um, so I think, I think something of that nature would be very helpful. Okay, well, something similar came up in your retreat around, well, this is stipends, but this is related to grants as well. So we've been talking about how to get that information to you. So we, we are working on it, and it's in your goals uh, that you, you'll be looking at tonight that you want to report on that. So we can maybe come back with a, a couple of different ways that we can present it to see what works for you. I, I think what's, um, what's been, it's hard to follow the story of where all the money's going, especially because a lot of the times I think we hear, oh, it's equity, it's a grant. And, and I think that led to my comments, or why I emailed you about 7.1. It, it's unclear as to how all this lines up. Um, maybe when we get the equity plan, it might, it, it, it's gonna be more improved. Our equity, I know, I know. Um, our AP already states that the board will receive, you know, that we're going to detail these things and how much money is being spent. So it's already in policy or in our administrative procedure to do it. Um, it, it just when it comes up like this, as you're just seeing thousand here, thousand here, thousand, so you don't see how it all connects. And I agree with your comments. A lot of this stuff is already set in the statute. A lot of this stuff does come in through certain funding sources and under equity. But when you look at it this way, there's no way in telling how the money's being spent, mixed methods, you know, it, it all could all be in one methodology of equity, and that's not, story's also not being told. Um, but this, um, I, I feel like these questions that keep coming up, some of them I feel like need to get addressed in our equity policy, sort of how we have with the budget, how we talk about reserves, and just some really clear guidelines so that that's clear, and that it's gonna take a while. It's not gonna be this year, probably, but I think that that will help with these questions. If that. We'll, we'll work on a format, maybe, and, and bring that next time to okay. see. Okay, thank you. Can we have a motion, though, to, to motion, approve? Motion to this? approve 8.1. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, I am. I'm just uncomfortable at this stage. Okay. Motion, motion passes. I think that's, um, that's the last item, so I would invite a motion. I think you need, to, oh yeah, 7.2. Sorry, what was that what you're gonna do? I was just going to have a, a, a general motion for the rest of the consent items, but unless I missed another item that had been pulled. Uh, motion to approve the balance of the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? If not, those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. May I just ask a question? Sure. Just as a follow-up to this, you pull so many off, every, every, at every meeting, you pull items off the non-consent, I mean the consent agenda, and you don't have much of a consent agenda. It seems to me that you need, if we need to just look at the kind of pattern you're using here because some of these probably don't need to be on the consent agenda because the consent agenda should just be i'm just talking from my experience the consent agenda should contain only those things that are just slam dunks they're easy that you typically would not have questions for it's not a discussion section it's not designed for that so maybe we need to separate some of these where you have a lot of questions so that it can be on a consent agenda and, and you can have a discussion. But the consent agenda just typically is supposed to go like that. Is it okay if we play around with this some um, to try to? Mm -hmm. Sure. 
divide them up into well, it's, a, it's a not, little more, there's no and, and then give you some more detail on some of these others too. But you, you just never have much of a, con, a non-consent agenda. Yeah, it's not consistent, and and, and that may be the problem. <laughs> to to have a really effective consent agenda, you, there, we need to be consistent in what we're concerned about, and uh, uh, and and maybe that's. Maybe that's the problem. The idea is to have a consent agenda exempting, say, th those two or three items that we're wanting to question. Then we approve the consent agenda, and then we go back and look at those two or three items. Is that your sense of it as, as well? My sense is that Dr. <laughs> B Dr. Benjamin is asking us uh, what, what items do we, in the future, do we as a practical matter, do not want to have on the consent agenda. And I don't know if we can categorize or... We can take a stab at it ourselves if you want. I'm, it was more rhetorical, I guess, in terms of... But that's my observation, that we spend a lot of time on the consent agenda, and that just should not be the case. Yeah. The consent agenda should just be easy stuff. And then you spend the time on the... I, well, I, I agree. And it seems like... Up until the last few months, that was generally the case. So oh, okay. I, I, but just since I got here. Uh, just since, yeah. <laughs> no. Or just since I became president of the board, I, they're trying to make it difficult for me. Trustee Nielsen. Thank you. Um, part of the problem, certainly not all of it, and is that I think we should give it a little more time before we take drastic action, um, because a lot of the definitions and the way they've listed things have changed a little bit. So when we look at something, it's not what is we Is your used microphone to. on? I can't. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, when we're looking at these things, we're not exactly um, seeing the same format that we're used to seeing in some of these cases, and that causes questions to come up. And, and then, like always, there's changing concerns. Right now, it's mostly budget. We're not, instead of matters of let's, how do we spend all the money we have, we're going, how do we do what we need to do with what money that we have, with less money. Um, so I think give it a little time, but I have noticed over the past year that a lot of the, um, the descriptions of items have really diminished. Uh, they've gotten shorter to the point where you know, you think you know what they're saying because you're used to looking at these numbers, but you only see some of these numbers like once a year, and you can't remember that perfectly. So we need better descriptions. I know it takes more time to read, but it's going to make the meetings shorter. That's just my opinion. Just give it a little time. Because <laughs> we've made a lot of changes in presentation of the information, and I think that's a good percentage of the, of the issue. Any other comments? Well, I was just going to agree that I think we've had maybe a few more recently, but by and large, it really has been a consent agenda. Okay. And I would agree with Craig that maybe some of the presentation has changed and that makes it different. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is item 10.1, presentation on implementation processes and plans for guided pathways. I'm looking forward to hearing this presentation. So <laughs> I understand this is going to be an interactive presentation. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Margaret Prothero, a proud faculty member in the Department of English Skills here, and currently serving the campus in the temporary role of Guided Pathways Faculty Coordinator. In May, I was here to provide you with a brief history and general overview of Guided Pathways at SBCC. So today, I return to go into more depth about some of our work. 
Um, over the course of this coming year, I will return with additional details and updates as they unfold and as we move towards our goal of our fall 2020 launch of Guided Pathways version 1.0. Now first, as you may know, uh, this is midterm week for summer session two. So in honor of that and all of our students, I thought I'd start with a quiz about guided pathways. So um, if you would like to either use your cell phone or members of our wonderful IT department, oh, I should probably do tr present. Where is it? There we go. Oh, you're so nice, nobody didn't waved their arms and said, hey, here we go. Um, members of our wonderful ID department have preloaded this website in your uh, Chromebooks here, or you can also go on your phones and just go to kahoot.it, or just open the little tab there on your, on your Chromebook. And you can do this individually, or you can do a team member if you want to play partner with the person sitting next to you. We'll go here. I closed mine. Here, there we go. Oh, I said I closed mine. But so you should, do you see the tab? Mm. Oh. Oh, okay. oh, there's the pin number. Okay. So you have the tab there, or if you go to Kahoot.it, you're just going to enter this game pin, and it will generate a moniker. So it won't be using your real name. And you can play again with a team, with a person sitting next to you, or on your own. We have two people so far. Are we to click on spin? Or Is that, or if, you want it, if you don't like the oh. name it gives you, Otherwise, you can spin until you find one you want to okay. stand by. Stick with what you gave. All right. All right, is that everybody? I don't see no, any. Does I'm, anybody need help? We can come and help. I'm not finding Kahoot. That's it. Oh, uh, it's out there. Hidden power. Is this yours? This is mine. Oh, yeah. Okay, so where? I'll open a new tab. Like this? Up right here. We have seven. Anybody can do it. Sure. It's open for all. A, A, H, O, O, But there are no prizes or anything. Dot IT. There you go. Enter game. The pen is up there. All right, are we ready to go? Everybody ready? Okay, so what's gonna happen is, uh, there are seven questions and one practice question. We'll start with the practice question just so everybody knows what they're doing. The question's going to be up on the screen, so you'll wanna look at the screen to see the question, and then you have 30 seconds to select your answer. You use either your phone or your computer, whatever you use to log on, uh, as your clicker for entering your answer, and then the score results will be up here. Everybody ready? Okay, so we'll start. Okay, here we go. The SBCC Guided Pathways Challenge Quiz. Here's the practice question, so here's what it would look like. The question will be here, and then you're going to select one of these answers and click it on your phone or your tablet. Gosh, which one? <laughs> I think it's just like a trial thing. And you have 30 <laughs> seconds. There's the countdown. It shows yeah. you how much time you have left. I think left. I just want you to click on something. What's, what's the question? What's the question? This there was the practice question. question. So select which one of these questions. is correct. Just click on anything. I don't understand. All right. I can, I can tell this is going to go well. Okay. Let's go ahead and try it. <laughs> Here's the first real question. Okay. All right. So far, here's our scores. All right. SBCC is one of how many colleges in the California Guided Pathways Project? So figure out which one it is and then click on the answer. Is it 10, 20, 50, or 132? It's 20. 17 seconds. All 
All right, the correct answer is 20. Yay, all right. Next, here we go, question three. So far, Super Pigeon is in the lead because you get points for how fast you enter your answer and how correct it is. Oh, tell us you had to be fast. Well, you, you got to be time. correct and quick. All right, here we go. Who is the lead for the California Guided Pathways Project who will return to visit SBCC in November? Is it Rob Johnstone, John Robstone, Stone Rob Jobs, or Bono? Fifteen seconds. My computer is slow. Oh, I guess, yeah. Three, two, one. And the answer is Rob Johnstone. All right. Blue Elk is in the lead with Joyful Buffalo following close behind. Here we go to the next question. The four pillars of Guided Pathways are compassion, education, integrity, and hope. Programs, counseling, transfer, library. Doric, Ionic, Roman, and Corinthian. Clarity, intake, support, or learning, and learning. Think about all our students taking their midterms right now. And the correct answer is clarity, intake, support, and learning. All right, Blue Elk remains in the lead. Next question, SBCC will call our meta major categories, what? Meta majors, academic and career pathways, Focus clusters or interest areas? <laughs> that is correct, academic and career pathways. All right, next question, six of eight. SBCC created how many academic and career pathway categories? Is it six? 10, 12, or 153? Six is correct. We have created six categories. All right. Blue Elk is very closely followed by Super Pigeon. Just a handful of points separates them. I just am so excited to see what's going to happen. <laughs> All right, question seven of eight. One-way guided pathways will help SBCC students as providing sample what on our website? Program maps, Google maps, building maps, topographical maps. That's correct. Program maps will be on our website. All right. And the last question for the, for the final answer. Is it going to be Super Pigeon or Blue Elk? <laughs> Here we go with our last question. The focus of Guided Pathways at SBCC is on our parking lots, library, pathways, or students. And by the way, that picture is my class. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> and the answer is everyone, <laughs> students. The focus of Guided Pathways is on our students. And here we go with Super Pigeon. 86, 84 points, seven out of eight, and followed closely by Blue Elk and Groovy Leopard. Well done, everybody. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, I got seven out of eight, but I got You're lousy numbers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay.
okay. Oh, yeah, for the other one. Okay. All right. Well, since we previously went through these slides in May, and you reread them again prior to being here this afternoon to, for today's session, I will just quickly review some parts of them now until we get to the section I'd like to talk with you more in depth about today. So this slide, as you recall, is a reminder of the description and statement of purpose of the Guided Pathways Project. The work of Guided Pathways looks to identify and remove barriers to success, close equity gaps, and increase the success of all of our students while supporting their goals. So it's about finding all the ways we can help students navigate college from the moment they begin their application um, through every step they need to take until they successfully achieve their goals of degree, certificate transfer, or um, entering a new career. And this was the quote from the Guided Pathways uh, website. This is a reminder of the references to Guided Pathways that you might come across these days because it's used a lot. Um, there's the Nationwide Guided Pathways Project. Then came the offshoot of the California Guided Pathways Project, of which we are one of the 20. And then additionally, there's the Guided Pathways Program set forth by the Chancellor's Office. Um, as part of the vision for success called the California Community College Guided Pathways Program. So across the state and the nation, community colleges are all committing to making structural changes that will simplify, clarify, and benefit all students. Um, I wanted to mention that the lead of our three-year intensive California project, Dr. Rob Johnstone, came for a site visit in June and spent the day with Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Ralston, and me. And as part of the CAGP process, he will be returning for a second site visit in November. I've added a link here to one of his documents that I thought you would find uh, helpful and interesting that you can read at your own leisure called Guided Pathways Demystified, Exploring 10 Commonly Asked Questions About Implementing Pathways. And then on the bottom link, you'll see other publications of his, which is the second, the second most 10 commonly asked questions and, and other things you can read if you like. But. Um, this is a reminder about the four pillars of Guided Pathways, clarity, intake, support, and learning. The pillar image is a common one Guided Pathways colleges use, but we added the words above and below um, just because we wanted to really emphasize that the um, focus is on students, the issue, equity gaps and opportunities missed, and our priority strategies integrated, strength assets-based, equity-driven, labor market-informed, rigorous academics, and comprehensive student supports and services. And a reminder, clarify the path and enter the path. Both have to do with supporting students from initial contact through the first day of class, including outreach, orientation, assessment, counseling, career exploration, registration, financial aid and then stay on the path and ensure learning are about ways we support students affectively and cognitively, help them access resources as needed, structure deliberate and intentional academic and co-curricular opportunities, and provide support for faculty development, faculty student engagement, and effective teaching and learning pedagogies and practices. Um, our team wrote the following Guided Pathways um, Guiding Philosophy at SBCC about identifying and removing barriers to success. And when I was here last, I emphasized number three, which we feel is especially important to create an environment where each student feels they belong here, we want them here, and that they deserve to be here. We believe that fostering belonging and connection is at the heart of our student success and needs to be at the heart of our guided pathways work inside our classrooms and out. These um, next slides, let me put these builds here, I'll uh, recognize in a reminders of over 100 um, faculty, staff, and managers who all have worked together thus far to do just amazing creative research, planning, discussions, and solution findings in work teams over this last year and a half. Okay, you know, here's where I want to pause and go into a little more explanation. So 
as I mentioned, Guided Pathways seeks to find and address barriers to success of every part of our students' journey. Okay, starting with their initial application to CCC apply, that's the required application from the state that students fill out before they can continue with our enrollment process and registering for classes. So if you haven't seen it, you might find it illuminating to go online and complete the state application yourself. And as you do so, please keep in mind what that experience might be like for an incoming student, particularly a first generation student or a student who may not have friends or family who can help him or her navigate the questions. We know we lose students in the application process. So here is one example of why this might be the case. This is a screen recording that I made of one of the questions on the application that asks students to select their program or major. So I'm just going to play this here. First, they're asked to select their um, educational goal. And then they have to scroll through this list that you're going to see in a moment. And take a look at it here. I think there's something like 177 majors and programs listed. And they're not in alphabetical order. And they have all these abbreviations and codes by the names. You can see that that alone could be potentially daunting and overwhelming to sift through. And remember, this is before they've even signed up for a single class here, including dual enrollment students, everybody. Now, for the student who comes in and already knows exactly what they want, you know, I want to earn my theater arts associate degree. I'm here as an engineering major. I want my cosmetology certification. OK, great. They can hunt through this list and eventually, hopefully, uh, find their program or degree and select it. But the majority of our students don't enter college with their goals clearly defined or have majors already selected. Um, however, even though they don't necessarily know their major, they probably know that they are generally interested in something to do with business or sciencey things or something to do with culture and society or the arts. So we created six groupings or categories of similar majors and programs by interest area. And after many hours of work and discussion on our meta majors work team and input from divisions and the academic senate and other guided pathways work teams i gotta click out i think here we go um, and josh ramirez psych 200 students surveying local high school students and lots and lots of back and forth and discussion and tweaking we created the following six um, areas academic and career pathways we call them um, academic and career pathways with the motto, explore your interests, discover your passion. And here they are. Now, the idea is when students go to the CCC apply application, instead of that long, complicated, confusingly organized, overwhelming list to scroll through, the programs and majors will be organized and filtered through these six categories. So that they select one of these six categories, and then we'll see a drop down menu of all the majors and programs in that area that interest them. Students will be assigned their academic counselor based on their selected academic and career pathway as well. And we're also looking at ways we can talk about careers in these contexts. And this is just the beginning. Uh, we have much discussion and thinking and work ahead of us this year in order to find all the ways we want to deepen and expand the idea of these academic and career pathways so that they are truly meaningful and helpful to our students and positively impact our students' experience on our campus to foster that belonging and help create strong connections and support. We may include these pathway groups, um, for instance, in our orientations on campus. For example, so incoming students who are interested in performing visual and media arts uh, might get a tour of the Garvin Theater, say, or um, see the Channel's Newsroom, uh, the Digital Media Lab, see a performance from our dance company, hear our jazz ensemble, and uh, learn about the clubs offered in those areas, meet some of the faculty and students who are already there, and start right away building connections and meeting others who share their passions and interests. And again, fostering that belonging right away. Um, or science students, right, could see the geology lab and learn about the astronomy club. It's just how they find their, their passions right away. So we have a lot of exciting and interesting um, creative discussions and innovations to look forward to this year. Um, another significant Guided Pathways piece that we're taking on is sample program mapping. 
which takes the meta majors one step further and shows students a sample plan for how to fulfill their goals in a specific amount of time. So academic counselors are working with department chairs to create sample program maps for all of our degrees and certificates that eventually will be online for students to look at in order to get a general idea of what that degree or program will entail. I included here an excellent article written about program mapping on our campus from the channels for your reference. And I can return another day to go over um, sample program mapping in more detail and as our work in this area progresses over the year. And this is just more information about maps for you. And a reminder about our Chancellor's vision for success goals. Um, we believe strongly that guided pathways work will be the means by which we can help our students get on a path to reach their goals in a way that's efficient, accessible, and equity driven. And that concludes my presentation today. I brought you all another souvenir that you can use to show your support of Guided Pathways work and to help remind you of the point of Guided Pathways as you talk to our community members, which is to identify and remove barriers to success, close equity gaps, and help all of our students be successful in reaching their goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have questions? Great presentation. Um, I'm sure I, I might, you know, go back to school and take a class from you. <laughs> <laughs> There's many wonderful teachers here. Any questions? I, I agree. I think it's exciting to to see um, the focus on helping starting students figuring out what the heck this is all about mm -hmm. and where do they go next. Mm -hmm. um, having had a recent experience with a son who went to college and him trying to figure out what he wants to do, mm -hmm. this program would have been so, so helpful. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it makes so much sense. I don't know why we didn't figure this out decades ago, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really an exciting uh, uh, a, a siding, exciting <laughs> approach to helping individual students succeed, really. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick question, just yes. showing the um, registration yes. page reminded me. So is that going to change with Guided path Pathways getting implemented? Because just someone mm -hmm. I know last week tried to sign up for classes here, and she was like, this is the most terrible system I've ever experienced. It's and very difficult. And what's difficult about the application that's from the state, we don't have much control yeah. over what's there. But they're aware of this, and I believe the chancellor's office is looking to correct it. We are hoping that we can enter in our meta major categories, our interest pathways, mm -hmm. and then create those filters. So hopefully by fall 2020, we'll have that sorted out. That's cool. our hope, for cool. sure. So, so when someone picks SBCC, it'll only give them the six yes. areas that we have. That's okay, that's yes. awesome. Thank There's you. other things we're trying to do to make that application a little more manageable. We're trying to add, um, we're going to add a, um, a web page on our website um, that will help students know, gather these materials before you do the application. If you have questions, come in, we will help you do the application. Phone this number, we will help you over the phone. And even short videos we have of the welcome desk students in English and Spanish for each question on the application, they have what's a common question, they're asked about it and they're giving a little pointer so we can have a list of those. All different kinds of ideas we're looking to see how can we help students just get through that application because it can be very daunting and that enough can be enough to make a student say, hey, college isn't for me, I don't belong here, this is not comfortable. So. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you, those are all great ideas. Trustee Haslin, did you have a question? Yeah, or I, I think this is marvelous. Uh, and I, I, I can't help but contrast it with how, uh, how it was for me on my very first day on campus at a community college where uh, I, I think I could describe that as uh, Having been thrown overboard, and and someone threw me a, a maybe maybe a, a some sort of a, a life raft, not tied to anything, but nevertheless there was I was told that there was a life raft there, and uh, and I was basically at sea for quite a while until I figured out the lay of the land. And part of the problem, of course, is that we don't know what we don't know, and therefore we can't ask 
intelligent questions for which the answers would help us get back on that path. So uh, I, I commend you for, for everything that you're doing. I think this is just wonderful. And, I, and I'm going to guess that over time, you're going to learn more by, uh, by the feedback that you get from students about what it is they really need help with. Absolutely. We have a lot to learn from our students to help us figure this out. Somebody? Uh, yeah. Trustee uh, Gallardo? Trustee Cronin, <laughs> I I want to chime in with a thank you, too, to you and all the folks who have been working on this so hard. Um, it, it's a little hard to see how it got so complicated, mm -hmm. but I do know adults with professional careers who have literally given up on our application system. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing as Jonathan mm -hmm. said. It just is um, it's a student loser, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, I'd love to see that fixed. And so thank you for all the things you're doing to make this simpler. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the bridge, the K-12 bridge and that component? One of the things we're looking at is how to help we're making a list, for instance, I'm going to give you a specific example, of all the courses in our local high schools that could be dual enrollment that would give students credit here and at their high schools. And one of the pieces, for instance, is how do we have students sign up for those? How do we increase the communication? So once we have the courses identified, then we need to tell the department chairs, did you know these courses are the courses your students are interested in the high schools? And then that will help inform when we offer them. So if the department chair knows, for instance, that a large group of high school students would like to take that particular history class, then that can be offered after 3.30 or in the evening. If you don't know that, maybe you don't offer an afternoon class and the student can't sign up. So there are all those kind of little pieces that have to come together. Um, so the things about meta majors, for instance, we need to talk about how we start um, bringing the high school counselors um, to learn about these categories, how we help incoming students um, identify those categories. One of the things we're talking about creating next year is a course that could be offered at the local high schools in the evenings um, for parents and families of students who are going to join the Promise to start educating families on um, what it means to be a, high, um, a student here from high school. Uh, what is a GETC? Uh, why is it important for your student to know whether they're going to be CSU or UC transferable? Why you have to know that before you start? Um, how can you support your student when um, things get really difficult week eight? Um, what are the resources you can use to make sure your student's taking advantage of the tutoring and so on? So the, things like that we're starting to explore with, with K-12, but this is such a big project and yeah. there's so many pieces so it just takes everybody coming together and bringing in their ideas so as you um, are in the community and come across other ideas and other ways we can connect and um, remove barriers to success and help our students reach their goals we're very happy to incorporate all those that's good thank you and then my other question is I guess more related to scope so when the last mm -hmm. session is September 2019 so what what does that mean for the pilot so the college has been going through the different uh, the sessions I forget what they're called um, the institutes the institutes yes we have our last one in September mm -hmm. right um, but we are set to roll out version 1.0 of Guided okay. Pathways fall of 2020. Okay, so then this, so our pilot will, in essence, sunset fall, this fall, and then we, as a college, are... We're looking to start changing the student experience. So if we do this correctly, the student experience this fall of 2019 uh -huh. should look different than the student okay. experience in fall 2020. Got it. So this is kind of like your benchmark kind of... Fall We're to still see getting how. everything in position yeah. to start. Okay. And that's just start 1.0. It's not going to yeah. be perfect, but it's a place to start. Yeah, no, I mean, so. it's a huge undertaking. Um, is there opportunity for board members, Dr. Benjamin, to attend the last institute? Well, Margaret knows better um, than I have any slots. I'm not sure. This institute, we've already um, locked in a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, the emphasis on this one is on uh, professional development and equity. So we have our professional development um, team that's going to be our specific team going. But I believe there are other opportunities for um, for working together. And as you know, our um, lead for the state, Rob Johnstone, will be coming on campus in November. Perhaps we can work something out where he can come and um, and meet with the board or or meet with you and. 
we can start there as a conversation. He's amazing. Thank you. Anybody else? Margaret, thank you again for thank you very uh, much. excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And Dr. Benjamin, just on the fiscal impact, this is not necessarily anything that's costing more. It's basically this, these are funds we already, I mean, the pilot was a pilot, but going forward to basically, um, we still have, sorry, Margaret. We still have funds. Dr. Austin can respond to that. Sorry. Oh, Dr. Austin, okay. So our involvement in the pilot project preceded the state adopting guided pathways. So when we joined into the pilot project, we actually, we won, <coughs> and then we got to pay for our involvement. So it was one of those interesting awards. Um, once the state provided resources to community colleges participating in guided pathways writ large, we had resources that offset that expense of participating. And we have um, three years of funding that's helping us do the innovation and implementation pieces. So we have funding that has bought time for faculty to do this work, including Margaret's coordination and other component parts. Does that, that answer that question? Yeah, I mean, it's always, you know, in education, oh, a good idea is always like, oh, and then we don't have money. So right. we, this is clearly such a huge undertaking that yes. we want it to be sustainable and sort of the new culture for our students right. that it's not going to be pending some. Right. Most of this work, when we're finished with the, the thinking and the designing and the building of it, will be kind of process redesigns. So a lot of that work, once we implement it, won't have additional costs. We're using some of the state resources that we've earned to buy the software program, the Bakersfield Mapper program that we're working with. So some of the tools that we'll be using, we're able to use uh, these resources that the state provided to be able to finance those. And then a lot of this other work is kind of shifting our thinking um, around how we're serving students and what it means to be kind of student ready instead of asking students to be college ready. Mm -hmm. So that is a lot of that shift. There are other pieces around really creating a guided pathways mentality that have to do with how buildings <coughs> are set up and organized, mm -hmm. how student services greets and creates a welcoming space. So there are things over time that will have um, additional resources attendant to that. Mm -hmm. But inside the, the initial work that we're doing now, most of this work is about kind of the designing implementation part. It's good, thank you. So then it's good that the facilities master plan presentation follows this so we can yes, see how they work in tandem. <laughs> thank you. Um, are all of the community colleges getting the same resources now for guided pathways or are we still part of a special cohort? So the financial resources that were based on headcount, all of the community colleges who met the criteria are receiving um, resources. And at the end of the day, it was all the community colleges were able to participate. The extra pieces that we're doing as part of the 20 colleges and the guided pathways, you probably all got that question right. Um, those resources are still attached to us as the group who's doing that work. So the institutes, for example, the access to Dr. Rob Johnstone, those components, those are still particular to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ralston. Okay, well, we'll now move on to uh, agenda item 10.2, the facilities uh, master plan. Good evening now. All right. This is so exciting. Congratulations. We've been working on this. It's still a draft, but it's still exciting to me. Well, congratulations on PE. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through this 100-page long document. I just want to give a, a refresher of how we got to where we're at today, kind of point you to some specific pages in here and explain it to you, and then, you know, we can chat and discuss all we want, because I know this is the first time the board is seeing the whole, the whole document in its draft form here. So as a reminder, we identified quite a long time ago the need for a, a clear facilities master plan for our district. It was actually identified back in 2015 in accreditation. And in the end of 2017, we hired Moss companies to come and assist us in writing this plan. No affiliation to me. Believe it or not, my last name is quite common. Uh, so we have been working with them for a long time to come to the place we're at today with this document. Unfortunately, some things kind of slowed us down with the work, with the fires and the mudslides and all the changes we've had going on. But we're finally here, 
and we have the draft. This is the first time the board is seeing it internally on our end because we kind of got it when school went out of session this past spring, I haven't gone around and showed it to a whole lot of our internal groups yet. So this fall, I'll be going around to the usual group, CPC and planning and resources and all of our various committees and sharing it with them as well. And we also need to go out back out into the external community, which we did ages ago. We met with the city of Santa Barbara, the county of Santa Barbara. We also did uh, community forums at the main campus, Wake and Shot and discuss the, the draft and where we were headed. So we'll need to go back and, and do some more um, discussions to make sure everybody has seen this and, and talk about it and get additional input on um, you know, what folks are, are interested in seeing, if not already included in the document. So just gonna cruise through some of the most pertinent sections and I'll also do a little reminder here that with a facility master plan, you can, have you know a three volume of 300 pages each of a facility master plan that cost the district a substantial amount of money and when we started going out and talking about doing an fmp we decided we wanted to do something cost effective simple short within the 100 page range something that people could really read and use wouldn't become a doorstop um, so that was the intent with this plan and, and we, we hit that on the head with, with the length this is at. It's, it's quite nice. It's simple. Um, but I will identify for you some things that I, even I think after working through all this that we still need to, to add to, make changes to. It's, it still is a rough draft. Um, but at least we're, we're making great progress with a plan to have this completed by the end of this calendar year, by the end of 2019. So here we go. Let me just quickly get to kind of the, the meat of the plan. Starting here, if you start with page 11, you can see that we have a general kind of template that is used to describe each of the core buildings. Uh, this was very intentional. We wanted to let people know what our buildings are, what they're used for. You can see it shows the number of classrooms, number of restrooms, square footage, things of that nature, and a brief overview of the building and the infrastructure uh, situation at, at those buildings. I received some great feedback right when I got this kind of draft that we should really beef up this overview section on each of the buildings and describe from a more student-centric perspective of what those buildings are used for. I thought that was fantastic advice, so we're still going to work on beefing that up a little more, kind of describe as you walk into the building, what is this building used for instead of just using the term, you know, classrooms and offices. So that's great feedback we already have. Um, but this is the general layout you'll see for each building on the first page. And then the second page pulls in information from the fusion report. So for those of us who have been talking about these reports a lot, what we did was a lot of information in here is just pulled from other places to summarize and make it clear uh, what's going on with these buildings. So this last section on each page about the buildings where it says the facility cost estimates, that comes from our fusion assessment report that was completed not too long ago, just in June of 2018. And as a refresher, that's a report that's completed by the foundation chancellor's office, uh, the California Community College Foundation. They came and did a thorough assessment of all of our buildings. And uh, we can refer to that document if you guys want. But that lists the current repair costs for each building, the replacement costs, and then that calculation that comes from that is the facility cost index. Um, anything kind of above 50% on a facility co facilities cost index is signifying to us that the cost to repair this building is significantly high. When you're getting above 50%, you're talking about, well, it's probably better to replace a building than continue to repair it. And unfortunately, you'll see that we're above 50% on a handful of our buildings. Lindsay, yep. do you want a question now? Sure. Or later? That rem so that... I was looking at that, I was like, what is that? I remember Eric talking about that, and there's like some formula where you come to that. Yeah, and I'm gonna remind you, if I can get there quickly it's without exciting. wasting our time. That all comes from, nope, not that one, this report. Yeah. Yes. Which we brought to the board. Okay. Yeah, yeah, another 100 plus page document that's quite detailed. So all that information is just coming straight from this report. Okay. Um, 
And then, so then, like, for example, is that, so like this building, like, yeah, you could repair, but like, because there's so much concrete, it's going to cost you way more money to like get all this concrete out to get to the plumbing mm -hmm. versus it just be better to just sort of renovate or, if, Was that that conversation mm -hmm. he was having with us? Yep. That was that, that was that conversation. Yeah. And sometimes when the building is, is so old minus the concrete issues, it's just, there's so much that needs to be repaired mm -hmm. that it would be more cost effective to bring the building down and replace it with a new building than continue to make repairs. Mm -hmm. but sometimes you can't even get to where you need to get to the mm -hmm. plumbing and whatnot. And then the energy savings with just new material. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like picture your old, your old car is not really going to have Bluetooth in the radio because it's, it's an old car and has an old radio. That yeah. idea as well. Yeah. New buildings are very automated. All the new smart homes and, mm -hmm. you know, that technology, if you get a brand new house and it's a smart house, it's the same for commercial buildings. There's a lot of improvements that exist. Okay. So the bulk of the plan, kind of the about 30 pages, is just describing all of the buildings, Okay. Then we get into a couple other pages I really want to point out for the board is this particular, this particular page 52. This is a reference to a presentation that I did to the board back in, it says up there, back in 2018. Uh -huh. So it's not saying this is our building prioritization for sure. It's just referencing the fact that we presented this to the board as a recommendation from the staff of what the billing prioritization listing would be. And now, I mean, a year and a half later, things have changed. I can even see things on here. Well, maybe this isn't exactly the order we would want, but one through seven in, the, in kind of the, the red area, the buildings we said that are in the poorest conditions, those are still the ones we think are, are in the poorest conditions. They might move around between one and seven, but uh, nothing's really switched from the green to the yellow or the red. Is that physical science, that one is got some issues with the uh, labs. So just a refresher, that's what this is. It was just presented in 2018 to the board. Now this next slide, page 53, the best funding options. This information was put together by our consultant, Eric Middlestead, based on the potential for us to receive state funding to either modernize or replace our buildings. And this was done back before the funding formula has changed. So a little bit of a disadvantage of this taking so long, now we've got information in here that has changed, of course. So we still have this in here now, that's still the best information we have, but as the year goes through and we see how the new funding formula works on the capital outlay side and see if it gets approved, that this would need to be updated because now the formula is different and it, it may shake out differently for us with these buildings and which ones we would be able to uh, receive funding for or not. Additionally, if we go back, um, <coughs> sorry to do this, but we have a note here under each uh, building the probability for state funding, that's referring back to that table, it's just listing it here as well as in the table, and we have a lot of comments about 0% local match. Well, now we know that there's actually required 25% local match. So that portion of the, of the FMP will have to update as, as new information comes. So just a, a heads up, we know that's changed. And then another page I want to point out page 54. So this is just a high level start to a potential bond project list. You know, I'm, I'm ready for input, happy to hear input of how you want this listed, if there's anything other, you know, other projects that, I don't know, I hope we didn't miss any projects, but any other thoughts, ideas of how we want, how we want this portrayed. Um, this is a very important, important page for us. Let's see. Then this whole next section of the document is really talking about all of the multiple facilities related and other plans that we have across the college that are integrated into this facilities master plan. So our educational master plans, our five-year construction plans, uh, our sustainability plans, which we'll have a new, a new one of those to drop in here now that you've just approved the sustainability plan tonight. Uh, all these different plans are integrated into this plan and come off of it. This is aesthetic design standards document is a very detailed plan that is a part of it. So we have a lot of plans that have been going into uh, 
this culmination of our final FMP. The program land location and land use master plan plump uh, is a part of it as well, something that we worked on quite a few years ago. So this shows all those different plans, and then we kind of get into the recommendations portion of the document. So this portion of the document, we get to about here, page 78, goes through each of the buildings and what the um, architect and uh, folks with Moss companies came through and identified as areas where we need to make improvements on those buildings. This is another section where I feel like it could be a little more detailed, a little more clear on the buildings and the projects that we're looking for. So I'm, I'm looking for feedback on these and would love to hear how everyone's feeling about the recommendation section. Because I feel like it's a little light and could be a little bit um, more. Can you explain aggressive. a little bit what was the methodology to identify those and maybe that'll help? Yeah, so let me jump to I think it's in the appendix here. What the architect did who works with Moss companies is they d went through and did this very detailed analysis with our facilities team of each of the buildings and came up with this, you know, all this data on all the buildings and kind of scored the buildings in the different areas, HVAC, fire, uh, suppression systems, the exterior of the building, the roof, accessibility, and kind of ranked it on each of those areas. And then they detailed it in this recommendation section. But I think we may have higher level things we wanna say. Like for example, it says the facility's in fair condition. Uh, it's got HVAC problems. Well, all of our buildings have HVAC problems except for the new ones. All of them have the fire problems uh, because we have a difficult uh, fire system that doesn't work very well. So it's, it's not really saying much about um, you know, well, this building has uh, the need for classroom improvements, things of that nature. It's, it's very much about the, uh, you know, facil specific facilities issues with electrical, uh, plumbing, things of that nature. And it's very repetitive because most of our buildings were built around the same years and have the same exact issues. So I think through some more uh, meetings through this fall, I'll get some more information that maybe our faculty and our different managers would want to see detailed in here that are recommendations for our buildings. Does that help? Um, you've mentioned a couple places where you would like our input, and I know we have talked a number of times about our own need for a discussion about priorities. Um, when do you envision this will happen? Dr. Benjamin, can I kind of defer to you? Because this is your, your area of how you want their input. The purpose of today is to give you the overview, just a first read of it. And then um, in August, we're having two meetings in August, one on the 8th and one on the 22nd. And we're talking again about facilities on the 8th. So we can do have the discussion, get the feedback from you. But we would like for you to come prepared, we won't be, we're walking you through it now, and then we'd like your reactions in that meeting, so that can be on the 8th or the 22nd, but we will be having more of a facilities. The FYCOP is on the 8th, mm -hmm. and so we could, probably that would be the best day to get your feedback, and so, schedule maybe 45 minutes to an hour for that discussion, because okay. that is a study session meeting. Okay, so rather than making comments now, hold it for Until the 8th, for a formal discussion, yes. For That's great because it's it was pretty soon to get this and then discuss it. Right, today, we so. knew we wanted yeah. you to have time to really look at it first to walk through it with you as we're doing now, and then then have you give us a response later. And do you, Lindsay? Do you anticipate have you mentioned some fine tuning that needs to be done? Uh, for example, the 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 latest funding formula mm -hmm. issues and whether it's twenty five percent or nothing right. and right. so would you anticipate making those changes before the eighth or the no I okay. don't I okay. would actually like to take this out to our groups in the fall okay. this version and get their input and get a lot of input at once and then okay. do one big change okay yeah yeah any other comments at this stage I'll, I'll I'll commit to reading it very carefully and I'm wondering if it is. If it would be helpful to submit, as we run across stuff, would it be helpful to submit a paragraph to you directly? Or? Yes, I was going to ask you to yeah. do that. If you have specific questions mm -hmm. prior to the 8th, just 
send them to Lindsay or to me, and to both of us, so we have them in advance and we're prepared to answer your questions. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Could I ask one specific question? Mm -hmm. On page 86, there's a column called space inventory number. What, what, does that, what does that mean? On page 86, where is it? Oh, space inventory number. I am going to guess off the top of my head that that correlates to the fusion reports and the numbers that are, the, the number of the building is numbered in our fusion report. Oh, it's just a number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just the building, the way they're numbered. Where would, um, I think, and I think I had maybe emailed you, Dr. Benjamin, um, when looking at our facilities, um, in, in your in looking at a building, and I know we have the keyless lock, so like it should in the event of God forbid we needed to shelter in place and lock our campuses, we could do that manually. Just mm -hmm. where so in this plan, would we be looking at buildings through the lens of of safety in that way, and and how we build buildings for the world that we live in now? And, and I'm thinking of the, the unfortunate disasters and the realities of, you know, yeah. and no one knows anything, but mm -hmm. knowing that, I think in the article, the research that I did, as buildings are being renovated, they are being renovated with this in mind of having people shelter in place, locked down, and what's the feasibility of getting students out and access and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So would that component live in something like this, or is that more when you get to designing with an architect and when we would you say design we want with the architect and the architect is working with the user groups and they'll establish standards at the beginning of the process mm -hmm. of things that would be that we would want contained in mm -hmm. every single building and there could be conversations with you as board members as well as to what kinds of health and safety features you'd like to see in a meeting, but that's in the design phase of the project. Okay, so it wouldn't be necessarily something that's infused in here as something we value in, facilities, in, a, in a facility? Not necessarily. Okay. Well, you guys kind of started asking me questions right when I was just about done. So <laughs> this last, the, the very last 20 pages of it is, uh, kind of a little uh, you know, dictionary here, which is always helpful with all of our acronyms we use, and then an appendix. Uh, so nothing too terribly interesting in these last few pages. I, I feel the document is, is pretty readable, which I said is, is intentional. We won't be able to, be able to read it and use it and know what we're looking for. Um, so the meat is about 40, 40 or 50 pages long. Um, and let's see. The only other page I want to highlight is actually the very last page to show you all of the different committees that we've been working with and different groups that we've gone through on the plan. And these are kind of the same groups that we'll be going to in the fall to explain um, where we're at with this draft and get more feedback. So that's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Lindsay. Will, will this process get to the point where, in terms of timing, Will we have a chance to say, yeah, you know what? We need to go for a bond measure. Well, we plan to have that conversation with you at the next meeting. I better read I'll carefully, say, huh? I'll just say, Peter. <laughs> okay, good. We began the conversation in your retreat on the 13th. Right. We never did get an answer. We, we intended, we had as a goal that day to get an answer, but somehow we did good not. Course. We think you were practicing avoidance that day, but <laughs> it will resurface on the 8th because we think you need to be at least thinking about it in the future. It doesn't have to be today. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts on that before we move on to uh, item 11.1, .1, which is development of our goals for 2019-2020? And just to quickly review, we, we had a had an in-depth discussion at our board retreat on June uh, 14th. Uh, Dr. Benjamin um, prepared uh, a document which attempted to uh, synthesize into a, a single document the uh, goals that we uh, specified and the activities to implement those goals. We had some discussion about that at our last board meeting. Um, and there was some uh, 
give and take on, on the uh, document. It was uh, eventually uh, agreed that Trustee Croninger and myself would take a stab at trying to synthesize the comments and come to a, a document that would hopefully be a consensus of what we believe the goals should be. Uh, and I, I want to thank uh, Marcia Ford, uh, doing the lion's share of the work in, in drafting that document. We then had a lengthy discussion after I received her, her suggested draft, and we went back and forth and arrived at another uh, draft, and I think everybody received a paper copy tonight, which has one additional change from what was on board docs, and that is the numbering system at Dr. Benjamin's suggestion was changed so that each activity has a unique unique number. Oh. So having said that, we don't need to um, well, our item uh, for tonight is to adopt our uh, our uh, board goals for 2019-20. Trustee Abood? Motion to approve the goals. Do I? And is there a discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, uh, all of those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hey. May, may I please make it a can comment? Happen. It's because you did a good job the first time. <laughs> well, I am so happy. Thank you very much. There's no discussion? No, I don't want you to say <laughs> Does, She doesn't well, no, that you I mentioned should, it. I should let it go, right? Yeah. But I do want to let you know what will happen next. So now that you have approved goals, we are going to, the, the senior leadership team will make a schedule. You are, have requested through these goals to have certain presentations. This is going to inform our work for the next year. So that next year, I won't be here, but you will hear my voice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when you have your retreat, you will reflect on these. You will have a very clear outline of what's been done. We're going to establish all of that for you and give you a calendar so that you'll know when all of these presentations will be made to you and you will be, you will keep track of, um, of all the activities associated with the work plan. We are taking your goals as a work plan for us. I've had a conversation with the president and the vice president about one of these uh, in particular, and I just want to share it tonight if it's okay. I didn't clear this with you, but I think it's probably okay. You can go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. We talked about this action step of having a community forum so that we can invite members of the community to interact with you, to hear you give a presentation on the state of the district. And my understanding is that this has been done before, mm -hmm. but you did it seven times. We're thinking one big meeting, one big invitation, a breakfast or something. We'll come back, have it on as an agenda item so you can determine how you want to do this. But we're thinking early in the fall term, I think maybe September or so, to have it here, send out invitations. Of course, Luce would be responsible for that. Send out invitations to hundreds of people in the, neighbor, in the community in your service area. Invite them to hear you give a presentation on the state of our district. <clears throat> so that would be one of the first activities that we will be planning for you. We will be doing a lot of the work, but some of this work is for you to fulfill as well, and we want to help you do that. So thank you very much for approving <laughs> your goals. Thank you for your you help with welcome, it. Oh, you're welcome, Dr. Benjamin. Anytime. <laughs> is there a correlation between agreement on complex issues and the time of the meeting as, as it approaches 6.30, is it approaches are we likely to be more eager to finish something? I think so. <laughs> I, I've noticed that. <laughs> okay, our next item is 11.2, Board Policies, Chapter 5, Annual uh, Review. Uh, so this is to reapprove them because nothing's changed. They're working, and we are sending them off. I move to approve... Reapprove for policy chapter five student services. And I'll second that, but I do have a quick comment to make Go just ahead. because I, had, I did ask for clarification and there actually were some minor changes, but we just couldn't see them because they weren't strike through. Um, 
but apparently they're minor and in line with recommendations from the league. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Is there, is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, I moved and Kate second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear the word motion in there. I thought maybe you're doing that. Okay, we have a motion by Trustee Gallardo and a second by Parker. Dr. Haslam. Dr. I had already no, seconded no. it. <laughs> we have a bunch of eager seconders here. And I defer it's to fine. my colleague, uh, <laughs> Trustee Parker. Okay, we have a second from Trustee Parker. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing no, no's, the motion passes. Next item is item 11.3, student trustee uh, uh, privileges. This is an item that uh, is not uh, for a vote or, or action, but an item that we have discussed on a couple occasions. And if there is a consensus from the the board on these uh, changes that would go to BPAP for their consideration. So I would invite uh, comments, questions concerning the, uh, the draft that uh, was attached to the board agenda. Any comments, questions? Trustee Croninger. Well, um, I did have some suggested edits to the draft we're looking at. So if folks have that in front of them. Yeah. The first one relates to um, the bullet point where we say the student trustee may attend closed session other than closed sessions on personnel matters or collective bargaining matters at the discretion of the governing board. And that is what we discussed. My suggestion is to add by majority vote on the specific closed session agenda item because we also did tend to talk about that, and I think it clarifies, well, how is the board's discretion going to be exercised? We'll know what we're supposed to do. Um, okay. That's my first suggestion. Um, the well, could we, maybe we could just stick with that for a moment. Is there any comment sure. on that change or any exactly. objection? Yeah. Okay. I was leaning towards leaving it as we have it and not allow the student trustee, um, given the comments, I, I don't know, Trustee Hoslin, maybe um, Craig, you had mentioned that it was just going to be too much for us to be checking with Angie every time, whether this counts or not, and to just leave it the way it was and simplify the workload on the president's office. And that's where I'm leaning towards not, you know, based on the comments. Trustee yeah, Nelson. I, I concur with that, but I... I would add, I put some quite a bit of thought into this. I, I, I like the idea of students being involved and learning. But you know, we really don't have hardly anything we ever even talk about um, in closed session that would, you know, that it would fit. That's why it's in closed session. And so, in, unless somebody could tell me that we've discussed something that falls into the category of what we're talking about allowing, and that it happens routinely or something, I can't see going, going with the change. Uh, there's nothing to do there. Um, certain things need to be in closed session, and that's what we, all we ever talk about in there. That's what's under consideration. Is so what? On I, that I, basis, I'm, I'm I sorry. Would, I'm, I'm you're going to cut me off No, on that I, just, I have a question concerning what, just to be sure I understand what you're yeah. saying, uh, Tracy Nielsen, is that, as I understand the way it's written, uh, if it's a personnel matter or collective bargaining matter, there wouldn't be a vote. It would be automatic that the student trustee would be excluded. That's how I read the, the, the proposed change. Right, so my question is, can you think of an item that was in closed session other than those categories? And so why are we, it's an exercise in what? But I, but I guess yeah. I hear you making the argument that we'd really have to vote because that's the case. But there may be some unique circumstance that would require a vote. So I, in other words, I don't. No, I don't think there ever has been a why would there be. 
I, I can say that the one other matter that the one matter actually that the student could come in on is real estate. Really? And so um, that's a question because it doesn't sound like real estate has come up often in terms of leasing, no. buying. And we could always selling. authorize an exception or something. I, you know, but this just this just adds unnecessary, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. um, complications for what real purpose. I, I just. I'm all in favor of change. Okay. I just want the change to have some meaning instead of, I, I don't, this doesn't register. Trustee Abood. I feel like this is almost not that different because it says, the current one says they don't attend closed session. The, current, the new one would say they only attend if it's not these things, but it's yeah. always those things. Yeah, yeah. But, then, but, but then we have to add to it to say, how, how are we going to authorize it? We just have to make it is, more complicated. You know, you do it any time, anyways, and we but, don't need it. But I think the other issue is security is another one that they would be able to go in for. Mm, and if Maybe, it, maybe not. You never know what's going to happen in the future. I just say it's good to have the option than not have the option. Every, everything else will almost be exactly the same, but if there is an incident in the future we need them in on, I guess we could have them under the change, but otherwise it's going to be status quo. I guess he's asked for it. And yeah. I would disagree about security law, and, and even a little bit it. about real estate. If it's negotiations, yeah. things like that, it needs to be in confidence. I, it doesn't lend itself that way. That's the reason that those matters are handled in closed session to it's begin with. It's the only with. other category yeah. that can be addressed in closed session other hmm. than personnel matters and collective bargaining. Potential, potential litigation or litigation, which might be unrelated to closed, collective bargaining or right. personnel. Right. And I guess I'm saying, when you live in the world of preparing agendas, okay, I, so. I, why add that to Angie's plate? I just, it, it seems just a little bureaucratic just to add it, but just in case, and then we'll vote on it. Just don't do it and just leave it. it it's fine. It, it, it seems to me that we, as we're discussing, that we rarely would, would be required to have such a vote because it would ra rarely come up. So I think the argument is that the student trustee has suggested and requested that we add this possibility. I frankly don't see much of a downside to at least having that option. Um, so that. That's how I view just, it. Just, I mean, it's not going to create any new work because right now, well, if there's a true. closed session item on personnel, it's not, no one's going to do anything because we all know it's personnel and it's not going to go up to a vote of the board. It's only if it is real estate, then we will vote. And it takes two seconds to write an agenda item that says the board will vote on allowing the student trustee into closed session. And then we do that and then we vote. Mm -hmm. I guess and that's a, that will happen maybe once in the next five years. Yes, that's true. And it's also, I, I guess I'm leaning from Lens that some of these closed sessions, they are pretty complicated and you have to check with legal and counsel and get an email and check with Angie and go back and you can't notice the agenda. And so you're going to delay all this because just the reality of legal, it's pretty complicated. And the way things are noticed and it's not as simple as, oh, it's just personnel. Uh, the student trustee... Um, as he or she should, would execute their right to advocate that they go in and will do their research and pull their own ed code. And it, it, it's just gonna open up a can of worms that in the end we're gonna have to go back to legal and go back and forth, back and forth to prove that, oh yeah, you're right, you actually can't go. And so why go down that route when these agendas are being spit out every two weeks, they're constantly, like you mentioned, in agenda mode. And a lot of these answers, we rely on Angie to contact counsel, to go back to the board president, to go back to the president. It's a lot of work. And it's the intent is good, and I honor it, and I respect uh, Kenny's role here. Um, and me suggesting that a student trustee not be part of closed session is not because of the lack of value that he or she would bring. It's for all those reasons. It just, you know, there are reasons why why this kind of thing isn't this kind of suggested change has not been, you know, popular, mm -hmm. or it, and was not done in the past. Okay. And without thinking about why intelligent people created those rules and left it the way they were for so long would be a mistake to make changes without due consideration. And I don't know that we've given it that kind of dual consideration. What we have given it is uh, the expression of a desire to change. Um, what, what we could do instead of making that change is we could agree to um, give after the fact briefings 
to the student trust a bit. We can't yeah. talk about no. but see, then that would require us to have a close meeting to decide yeah. what, what could be revealed, you know, after the fact and how soon after. So, but things could be, there's other ways that this might be accomplished to provide education without compromising the timeliness and effectiveness of what we need to accomplish in those closed sessions, which, thank God, we don't have every month. Um, th does anybody else share the uh, objections raised by uh, Trustee Nelson and Trustee Gallardo of not allowing this option? I, I mean, I don't, I don't really have the concerns, but um, I also feel like it is practically a moot point um, and that it's not worth time, the time to spend on it that much. Okay. Um, and so to me, whether it's in one way or out the other way, they're, they're almost the same. Um, so I think that it would be better just to move on to some of the other areas. I'm fine with leaving it the way it is because... Leaving it the way the draft is or leaving I, it I, the frankly, way... Frankly, either way, because we're not taking action on it tonight. Yeah. It's going to go off to the BPAP and we could hammer that out later, yeah. but um, to okay. me it's kind of six to one, half a dozen the other. So, Trustee Croninger, you had some other um, yeah. tweaks um, you wanted to suggest. Tweaks. Um, the bullet point on the mileage allowance and compensation. Um, I was just suggesting that we change that the student members shall be entitled to compensation to the same extent as the monthly meeting compensation received by board members. What that does is incorporate the, if you don't come, you don't get paid, basically. So you have to come to the meeting to be entitled to compensation. Okay. Um, I think that just clarifies it. And then in the next one, I would say, um, shall be recognized as a member of the board at the meetings, including receiving all materials presented to the board members on agenda items, except those pertaining to any, on agenda items, I'm adding. Because there is a fair amount of communication from our president from time to time on personnel or collective bargaining, which is not for a closed session and is not even necessarily for an agenda item at the time. Okay. Any comments on those suggestions? Sounds good. Okay. Sounds reasonable. We pass it on. Are we passing it to BPAP? With or without the modified language on the second to the last bud on the first page, we, we need to know. I I would suggest you guys send it off with don't uh, attend closed sessions. Uh, just um, Marsha, Peter, please. <laughs> um, given the last seven years of just the way people interpret things and the way one feels that they need to exercise their given right on something. Let's just leave this one the way it is. I agree. I, I think we have so many other things that we need to spend time on. If, if this is another example of much, to, much ado about nothing, let's leave it alone. So I think I, we'll I'm leave it I'm fine with that too. I'm pretty much where Kate is, that it's gonna be so rare that I'm not sure mm -hmm. it is more than symbolic, so. Yeah, I think you responded favorably to the student trustees request with or without that piece. Well, I understand the feeling that closed sessions are more interesting than they actually are. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us do not want to be in there. Yeah. Correct. Without dinner, just kidding, Angie treats us well. <laughs> do we need any uh, further clarification for BPAP? I don't, I think, I think we're good. Okay. Um, let me go back to the All we have left at this point is report from board members. Do any board members uh, wish to report anything? Since um, I since I cut Trustee Nielsen off, Nielsen off, and I apologize for that. <laughs> but uh, I was don't trying. Don't let it happen again. I was trying to seek clarification. We'll start with you. Do you have any anything to report? Um, I only have one minor thing. I, I had a really nice experience uh, last week in Puerto Vallarta. And um, before I left to go down there, there were a bunch of Puerto Vallartans in Santa Barbara. 
and I met one of their city council people who was very interesting, interested in, um, and asked if, if anybody could help them a little bit with ideas or how to do something, and they could, because they want to teach English as a second language in Puerto Vallarta in their school system. And someone in the group and she didn't speak, her English was not good well enough for me to really have a great conversation with her, but somebody in the group said, go find Craig, and they did, and, um, and um, I asked our president, Helen, if she could give me some guidance, and she's doing so, and maybe we can help them on how to implement the English class, ESL classes in Mexico. There's a big need. It's a, uh, to me, it's supply and demand. It's, uh, there's a big need in the tourist industry in Puerto Vallarta that's growing like crazy. And uh, they have a shortage of people that can speak English well enough to work in the hotels. Um, because most of the tourists don't speak Spanish. So, mostly Canadians and Americans. Trying to, especially in the wintertime, to get away from the snow. But that's maybe not real relevant, but it's Youth and, and education, health, sanitation, education are concerns of mine, especially youth. And um, having worked with student exchange programs and such, um, and tried to start a, and did start um, a teacher exchange program overseas, uh, this is uh, to me quite interesting. And um, I will be devoting a little more time to it over the next couple of months. So I just, I'd share that even if it's not direct. Thank you. Trustee Garo. Yes, well first, uh, Peter so graciously brought a bag of apricots to share. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and please feel free to take some. I didn't pass the telephone, I thought, gosh, the meeting's gonna, people are gonna think we're doing some brand violations, so go get your peaches. Are they from the Haslam uh, Orchard? Yes, yummy. That, that is, if, if we ended the meeting by 6.30. <gasps> <gasps> Darn. Oh. Okay, well then I'll Too wrap up uh, my comments. So my comments, I had emailed uh, Dr. Benjamin about this. Uh, and so we have our AP, we have our board policy already <laughs> on equity. And the AP, it already outlines that the board will, um, will receive a plan and the sources for all the activities that are on there. Um, I... We're going to be starting to do community forums, possibly. I'd like us, just as a board, to get ahead of this. A lot of the things that come to us, a lot of the money that we have is grant money. A lot of it is spent on equity, equity. And I don't know if that's necessarily clear in our funding streams are clear to the public. And it's all taxpayer money anyway. It's not like grant money is not taxpayer money. Um, so I don't know if it's maybe something we look at the policy, and I'm thinking of the way when you guys revised the um, the budget and the reserves, and it was just very clear. Um, and that way, there's no question. You know, if the college has a goal of X, Y, Z, and they're going to provide money and resources for this. Then it's available, it's transparent, and no one's questioning us. People aren't having to go to public records, things like that. Um, that is a big undertaking, um, but it's already in the policy, so. I, as one board member, I'm not going to say, oh, Dr. Benjamin, please provide this. So if there was interest uh, for the majority of the board to see this streamlined um, and a little bit more transparent, I would like to see that happen um, ahead before people come to us. And we tell our own story before perception takes off that we're doing this or that with our money, um, especially in the area where we do have a lot of equity money and we do have a plan that's supposed to follow that money. Trustee Cronger. Well, I think I would support Veronica's suggestion in, this, uh, in the broad sense, and I'm always in favor of trying to be transparent with our programs and with our, what we spend, our, the ways we spend our money. Um, and this might fit as well under 12 items for future board consideration, which would you know, be some agenda item where we would discuss that, which we will see the plan anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't have anything beyond that. Okay. Trustee Parker? I don't have anything to report. I do have something for uh, item 12.1. OK. Trustee Aboud? I um, attended a session at UCSB about establishing a family justice center in Santa Barbara. And UCSB got a grant to do this, but it's not UCSB specific. But they got the grant to explore and hire the consultants and look into it. 
and it would be a way to centralize services for survivors of sexual assault and other crimes like that and kind of put everyone in the same house to support survivors. It was a, they've done it so many other places. It's a successful model. They've been trying to do it here. It didn't work out 10 years ago, but this is the effort to bring it back. I think it would be great for us to be involved in that. I, when I was there, I didn't see anyone from SBCC there, but some others weren't in the room because it is vacation time. And so they're gonna have another session in the next couple months. And um, yeah, it, would, it might require a joint powers authority that we need to enter into with the other agencies. So that's a thing we'd have to consider as a board, but it was a great session, great idea, and I think we should be supporting it. At least, I wanted to comment, at least in the area of um, human trafficking, we are, and through the foster youth and City College has been very involved, and in fact, I think it was a grant through the Chancellor's Office, and um, that is in our, um, anyway, it's in our student services, and so I know City College has done a lot of work and a lot of outreach, and the Junior League's focus was human trafficking, and so they put together a lot of, um, or the college actually put together a lot of the information sessions for the community. Judy, Judy's heading up that work, so that you might want to connect with her because that is something the college has already been involved in. Yeah. Trustee Haslam. In the uh, interest of my uh, process of apricot distribution, I pass. <laughs> um, thank you. I look forward to uh, trying I have, one I have of them. a tree that's doing an abundant uh, job. Um, my tomatoes aren't doing very well. It's not lack of heat. We're sorry. Anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, I just want to comment that I think everybody on the board got an email from our uh, president search consultant from Pamela Fisher, it just for everybody else's benefit that's moving along. Luz has been, uh, uh, Luz Reyes Martin has been working closely with uh, Ms. Fisher. And we have the, I think as everybody knows, the, the website up and also the print advertising has begun in various publications that reach uh, potential candidates. So. Just to remind people, I think the deadline is the middle of September. That's coming up on us faster than we uh, realize. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing about all the great candidates we, we have. Robert, a question on, on dates. Um, that date that we're reserving for the interview dates, um, assuming that we need the next day, is that something that is like a placeholder? I didn't see another date aside from like you interview to decide and in the event that we would need another day to sort of come back together, um, is that, do we have a placeholder for that? I didn't see that, so can we request that from her? I can Unless, I mean, I don't know what you guys. I agree, I, th I think we talked about it earlier and using the following day at least as another option and depending on how many candidates we're interviewing, if there were five, for example, I feel like that's too many to cram into one day. Um, but it also could be a question of coming back together and making a decision, just hard to tell at this stage, but holding the date might is important. Sounds like a good idea. We, you're talking about the day after we would be doing the... Uh, I would suggest yeah. that. I mean, I think it's yeah. a Friday, and then that would be a Saturday. Um, yeah. Would be the next day. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, and you might have a candidate who literally can't come on Friday, and yeah. yet we want to interview them. I bet they'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> if they want the job, they may show up, I think. Okay. Well, thank you. Ever Lou said she would let her know. Yes. Yes, I heard that. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, okay, thank you everybody for, I thought it was a good meeting. Number 12. Oh, number 12, thank you. Um, we, it's been pointed out to me that we often uh, move over this item and forget to discuss it, but does anybody, we, we've heard a couple items already, but does anybody have any other uh, ideas or thoughts or requests for agenda items in the future? Trustee Parker. Yes, um, I think that we've kind of been talking about it a little bit on uh, uh, at meetings here and there, but I would love to uh, visit uh, board policy 2350 on speakers and Trustee Hasland, I think you specifically have brought that up. Um, and so I would love to get together with you and, and talk through 
board policy 2350 and then um, see if there's something that we could bring back to the board for discussion. That I think is, uh, I agree, that's an item that uh, is worthy of discussion, <laughs> if not action. Any, anything else? If not, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed?